and welcome to the future, otherwise known as episode 38 of Tomorrow's World Audit Time. Evening, Mark. Evening, Ross. How are you? Oh, Mark. I'm both exhausted, but very, very pleased with myself, Mark. I've spent the past month, uh, I, yeah. I, after, after the last episode, I finished recording the last episode, Mark, I strapped on my uh, e- Explorer's gear, my miner's helmet with the lamp on it, and I ventured mm-hmm. down far into the deep recesses of uh, Michael Rod's VHS basement. Mm. I've just spent the past three weeks down there. and Spelunking through the Rod archive. Exactly, here. yes. And, I mean, you would not believe some of the things I've seen down there, Mark. Things that <laughs> should never, ever see the lights of day. But, All the but albums he's recorded. After th- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But after three weeks, Mark, I finally emerged from the darkness, clutching a, uh, a, a little scene uh, tape all the way back from uh, March the 7th, 1989, Mark. And do you know what was on that tape, Mark? No, I don't, Russ. Well, I mean, I do. It was. Go on, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it was an episode of Tomorrow's World featuring a talking Hoover. <laughs> yes, listener, mm. listener Dave Smith, your wishes have been granted. I have found the episode that you asked about. <laughs> so, yeah, what better thing to do than to just cover that episode? And what an episode it is, Mark. What, a, what, what a, all sorts of treats it is, isn't there, as well as a talking hoover. <laughs> as a talking hoover. It is. It's a, it's a good episode. It's better than the last one. Jesus Christ. Yes, I mean, that's the biggest thing, isn't it? I mean, I would say that, it, once again, it's happened, this happens quite a lot to us, doesn't it? We, we'll do a, a, like a, a very late era episode, and then we'll go back to one of our favourite eras. And the, the <laughs> absolute sort of whiplash in quality... Uh, between between mm-hmm. between mm. them is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, it, it hurts. I, I, my my shoulder still hasn't recovered. <laughs> actually, it's quite quite painful for us. <laughs> yeah, so um, there was nothing to prepare for this episode uh, because you know it's a listener request. So there's no sort of background to it. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I don't, no, I don't know anything about. Yeah. Great that we can fulfil dreams, though. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I could have done some research yeah. into Dave Smith, I guess, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a few of those in the phone book, so I couldn't even do that. So, yeah, I mean, I guess without further ado... Not where you live. Shall we just crack straight into it? Mmm, let's. Good evening and welcome to Tomorrow's World, where you've just seen Chris Aston in action there, Britain's number one crossbowman. And if you missed him, well, take a look at this, a perfect picture of an apple being shot. And this remarkable picture was taken in just two billionths of a second with a new high-speed camera. In a few moments, we'll be trying to get a picture as good as this live in the studio. Do you reckon you can hit that apple again? We'll give it a good try, Maggie. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Chris. Judith. Also in tonight's programme, I've been to Hawaii, where the deep waters of the Pacific are being used for a new type of farming. Hampton Court and how technology is helping to restore it three years after that fire. And how the humble car wash has taken to the air. First of all, though, let's go back to Maggie and those high-speed pictures. Well, this is the camera which produced that remarkable image. And we've got it all set up, ready to take another picture. And perhaps it's worth saying that it's that silver foil just behind the apple there which actually triggers the camera. And providing that Chris hits the apple again, we'll be able to show you just how that camera works. It's all yours, Chris. Well done. Great shot. Now, that picture has been stored and it takes round about 20 seconds or so to get a print on this instant film. So let's just pull that out and we'll let it cook. Normally, you'd need a special high-speed film camera and some very powerful lights to take such a picture. But this system uses a video camera and it takes still pictures. What's unusual is that the images are of such high quality that they're practically indistinguishable from conventional black and white photographs. Right, when we come to the moment of truth here, I'm quaking. Let's just see how the picture has turned out. And just look at that. Look, you can even see the juice coming out of the apple. Isn't that remarkable? 
<laughs> Marvellous. The camera's based around a light-sensitive microchip. And you can see it if I unscrew the lens. There it is. This type of chip is known as a charge couple device, or CCD. Now, they've been used in many modern video cameras, but never with such high resolution. This new CCD has over a million separate light-sensitive points. That's over twice as many as on any previous TV camera. And because a CCD chip captures an image all at once, rather than scanning through it like a normal TV camera, these new cameras can take sharp images even of instantaneous events like that Apple. Now, at the moment, the camera's high definition and easy storage of images means that it lends itself particularly to jobs like factory or office security. And obviously, the quality of these pictures makes it easy to identify intruders. Look at that. Now, you can plug the camera into any video recorder and you can store up to 30,000 high-definition pictures on any one cassette and six months times a colour version is expected so still video may well become the way we take our holiday snaps in a few years time all right let's try this out then maggie smile <laughs> how about that we i am smiling yeah, well, there we are now select anyone you like oh lovely look at this there <laughs> <Not bad. laughs> it's great <laughs> Would you have believed it, Mark, that in the scant few <laughs> episodes of Tomorrow's World that we've covered, two of them have opened with Maggie Philbin and archery? What are the chances of that? I, I, I genuinely, I was uh, gobsmacked because I think so. We've done thirty-eight, which is what, like, um, one hundred and forty, seventy. So it's like 025 percent of all <laughs> Tomorrow's World episodes that ever produced, and we managed to find two that open in almost the same way. That's <laughs> that's mine. Blowing, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I mean, unless unless it's like some sort of running thing, every year she, you know, some sort of tradition, <laughs> she does some sort of archery opener. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, in, in this case, we're not looking at the bow technology at all, really, are we? Here, in, in this case, no. <clears throat> this isn't somebody's A level project. <laughs> no, we're just using it to demonstrate uh, how amazing this new CCD high speed camera is, and how it can sort of capture very, very fast moments um, in crystal clarity. And obviously, you know, I guess crossbow bolts go quite fast, so that's probably quite a good way of demonstrating it. Mm. Adds a bit of excitement to what would probably otherwise be a bit of a dry uh, demonstration, especially when they do try and demonstrate it with just Maggie. Her demonstration near the end of the piece is absolutely awful. Awful, <laughs> awful, awful. awful. <laughs> I did like burn it down. Yeah, when it opens, when I watched it, um, it opens and we're focused on the apple because obviously it's firing an apple. Because what else do archers fire at apart from apples? Of course, of course. <laughs> it's absolutely true. Nothing. They absolutely hate apples, don't they? What, what is it? Is it just because of William Tell? Is that what it is? <laughs> yes. can, can they just? I don't, can they... I don't think. I don't think. I don't think because they're not innately, you know, uh, angry with apples. I don't think. I, I, I think you it's um, think? it's a it's a, it's a complete affectation. <laughs> All oh, right. It's not that they just can't afford, you know, more exotic fruits. You know, they, that's what you love to fire a bolt a papaya, but they just can't. You can't stretch the budget to it or anything like that. I don't know. How much was a papaya in 1989? <laughs> Why have you not added that to our list of prices, Russ? <laughs> I don't sell them in Argos. I, when I was watching, it, I go, "Why? The, why is that apple blue? Because the apple is quite clearly blue when when it, when it first yes. starts." And obviously, you pointed out it's so that they can do this lovely transition from the yes. blue opening titles to the blue apple. I, I thought that was yes, they they cross fade from the the blue globe into the apple. Mm. Uh, quite neatly done, I yeah, think. It's a lovely piece of business, that isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We see Chris Ashton, who is the UK's number one crossbower. Oh no, no, please, please, say, you have to say it the way Maggie did, crossbowman. crossbowman. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, uh, the proper name for a crossbowman is an arbalist. You know that? Oh, that's a good. That's a good word. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Chris Aston. I discovered that he was uh, one of the founders of the National Crossbow Federation of Great Britain, which I was quite surprised by because the crossbow is famously an old weapon. Yes. But yeah, the Crossbow Federation was only founded in 1984. Mark, what was what was all the crossbow wielders doing before that? They just just um, loose cannons, just going around, just without any, any sort of cannons, representation. Yeah. Just renegades, just <laughs> throwing their badge and crossbows at their boss. They just want to do their work without the rules. I don't know, but the thing is, like, it, it dawned on me, it's like, oh, it looks incredibly expensive, his crossbow. And um, he's wearing this incredible kind of um, set of uh, eyewear as well. Which, and, I, I, which um, I realised what it reminded me of, uh, Universal Soldier. That's what it reminded me of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. But the thing is, it's not an Olympic sport. No. So it was like, 
he's paid for all that. It, it's funny. How did he learn that he was great at crossbow? What kind of sane person decides? Oh, do you know what I want to be? I want to be. I want to be Britain's number one crossbowman. <laughs> so in a sense, it makes sense that he would have created this governing body himself, so that he could put himself atop. Yeah. You know? So there was some kind of system in place to kind of divine who was the best. And it just turns out it just happens to be Chris. <laughs> I wonder why it's not in the Olympics. Is it too easy? Do you think? Because you can aim it like a gun. I think it's too easy, Russ. To be honest, yeah, I think it's too easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what probably possibly one of the reasons why he became number one crossbowman in the country, sorry, arbalist in the country, was uh, that he <laughs> not only owns uh, runs Sunset Arches, which is a archery course three miles north of Kidderminster, but he also owns the Bow Sports Archery Centre. Oh, really? Which is Britain's largest independent ar- archery shop. He's very much sort no, of. Who is in there? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's been running since 1984 as well. So he's kind of advertising himself there. Maybe, maybe he's hoping that. So people who watch this go, ooh, quite fancy getting myself a crossbow now. It looks like fun. Well, I, 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 I don't know that you thought that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I also would have no doubt if your dad turned up at your house even without you thinking and just gave you one. <laughs> you probably just nicked it from Heaver Castle, didn't you? You're probably just lying around, aren't they? <laughs> actually, weirdly, uh, we, we used to have a neighbour called uh, Nobby. He worked at, at the sports place at Crystal Palace, and he once came home with some professional archery equipment, which he'd found there. He <laughs> found at work. Used to play with that in the field next door. Of course he yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. He used to fire it into a That's into quite a bucket commute, on a pole. Isn't it? Yeah, if you want to buy a crossbow from them, you, the cheapest one you can get is the Horizon Redback Pistol RTS. It's only forty six ninety nine, Mark. But Gosh, that is much want, cheaper than I expected. Yeah, if you want to top the absolute top of the range, the Excalibur Twin Strike, which which has got actually two bolts on it. So you can fire. I don't think you can oh, fire yeah. them at the same time, but you can fire them in quick succession. So, but I suppose you could like like pin a man to the wall like by his hands or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah, but only if he's carrying two apples. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That would cost you one thousand six hundred seventy-five pounds. So you know, I mean, that, that, it's quite a lot of money, but it's still less than. It, it just strikes me as one of those things where you know how you, you learn about something. You go, oh, this is kind of interesting. That's kind of yeah. But in order to actually be any good, like it, it, it's one of those things where like, oh yeah, you can get one for a hundred quid. But the real professionals. They're worth twenty five thousand yeah. pounds or something like that. It's like, so actually, fifteen hundred isn't bad. Yeah. Oh, you can never be. I suppose you can never be number one because Aston's always there, ready to t- well, no. snatch the crown from. He's got that sealed up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and of course, one knows whenever you're around a crossbowman, you should never have anything at the top of your head. Crown, <laughs> apple, nothing. It won't stay there for long. Yeah, oh, crossbows, Mark. They don't know whether the Chinese or the Europeans invented. I think the Chinese and the Europeans have probably invented them separately to each other because they both seem to have them and they work very slightly differently. But they've been around since the since the seventh century BC. Gosh, yeah. The Han Dynasty in China were particularly big fans of them. They they found an inventory of what how many weapons the army of the Han Dynasty had, and they had seventy seven thousand normal bows, and they had five five hundred and thirty seven thousand crossbows. It's a lot, isn't it? Apparently, really good. That is a lot. Really good for shooting Mongols because they're on horses. And they had one, uh, no, no, one, they had a few giant crossbows that were the height of a man. And the bolts that they fired could fire for up to a kilometre. So if you wow. saw, if you look looking across the plains, you saw a Mongol a kilometre away. Just, yeah, yeah. They're never not fun, are they? Like the ones in uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Although, yeah. don't get it confused with a ballista, because a ballista looks like a giant crossbow, Mark, but they are not crossbows because they work different. So there you go, yeah. I, they're, they're, I will note All of the articles down. I read are at great pains to explain that. that. A ballista is not a crossbow. So I can't remember whether one in Lord of the Rings is a ballista or not. It probably is. That's more of a siege weapon, isn't it? And the thing is with weapons, Mark, yeah. I, I, I noticed this when, when I was looking up guns in the previous episode. The amount of detail that goes... Like, there's more detail goes into articles about weapons than basically anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Just reams and reams yeah. and reams. Reams yeah. of information. About yeah, them, right? yeah. The other interesting things about crossbows. Oh, yeah. So in <clears throat> Europe, the Greeks and Romans had them, and then in medieval times, like most of the European armies adopted them, with one exception, Mark. The English. The English didn't adopt the crossbow very much. We had a few of them, but we we, we didn't wholesale adopt them because we thought that the longbow was more reliable, especially in wet weather, because a longbowman can just hide his string in his pocket and then get it out when when it's dry. Whereas crossbows all get like messed up in wet weather. And proof of this, mm. Mark, is that we took on the French 
several times where their army main had crossbows and we had longbows in uh, in uh, well, Poitiers, Crecy, and Agincourt. And each time we absolutely thrashed them because uh, their crossbows were rubbish compared to our longbows. So uh, yeah, after that, the, the, the popularity of the, the crossbow sort of fell out of favour, especially with the French. Lead Arnold da Vinci... <laughs> He came up with the idea with the idea of a rapid fire crossbow. He did that thing where he drew the the concept, and then nobody ever made it. I seem to be the thing for all Leonardo's things, where he invents all these stuff but never actually tries to make it. But then somebody actually did make mm. it in 2015, and it turns out it's really good. It's like it's got a, it's got mm. a rapid reloading system that no other crossbows have, and apparently it works really well. And most famous person to be killed by a crossbow, Mark? Uh, by crossbow? Yeah. Gosh, King Harold? Is that a crossbow no. in the eye? No. This is just a normal arrow. I don't know. Who, who is the most Richard the person? Lionheart. Richard the Lionheart. They were, they were trying to take... There's this one castle in France which just had two knights in it, and they were so badly equipped that one of, one of the... This, this knight called Pierre Basile... Basile? He, he was so badly equipped, he was using a frying pan as a shield. Uh, so Richard the Lionheart wow. just didn't bother putting all his armour on because he thought it was going to be a piece of piss. And Pierre managed to shoot him with a crossbow, managed to kill him. Poor old Pierre that was then subsequently flayed alive. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Well, hey, still, you got to remember, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, in, obviously in Britain, you have to be over 18 to own a crossbow. Uh, and he, just last week, Mark, a week ago, the Home Office has put out one of its... Um, call, was it it's like a call for information or something like that, did they say? Or mm. it puts out the feeders asking whether we should mm. tighten up the laws on crossbows. Because there was that bloke who was found in the grounds of Windsor Castle a couple of years ago, wasn't there? With a crossbow. Yes. So they yeah. decided to look into it. So they've opened up a consultation. They have, yes. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I, I imagine old Chris, Chris Aston will be straight straight over to the Home Office to have words. Doesn't want to lose business. Doesn't want to stop you know, selling those Excaliburs. No, true, yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's crossbows, Mark. So what we've got here, basically, we've had a high-speed camera before, haven't we? Ages, yes. But this is many, many years ago. Quite recently. Well, yeah, but it's many years ago yeah. in Toronto. I mean, for, for us, not yeah. for tomorrow's world, yeah, yeah. But that was like a super-fast film camera. Film camera, yes. yeah. That's, uh, old Raimondo demonstrated to us. But here, because we're far farther in the future, this is this is basically, this is, a, this is a digital camera. I it's probably quite unusual to see a, a digital camera. I thought so. Uh, I mean, I remember the first time I ever saw a digital camera was probably in the late 90s, I think, that I remember seeing. I had one when we were in sixth form, I think, yeah. It was great, loved it. Yeah, although this is a digital camera where it still prints on film, doesn't it? Yes, well, it's kind of a Polaroid yeah. sort of thing going on, isn't it, yeah. And it's a two-hander, so Maggie's in charge of archery section, but then Howard's actually here to explain to us actually how the thing works. Actually, maybe they just mm. put Maggie in the archery section as a tribute to her previous archery segment. Because she doesn't really need to be there, does she? Howard could have just done the whole thing no. himself. Yes, actually, that's absolutely <laughs> true, yeah. It's a bit of a, yeah, it's, it's odd that he just comes in halfway through to explain everything. Yeah. Do you think that's you think he's being sexist there? <laughs> it's just too, too complicated for Maggie to, to explain. Oh, let's, we'll, we'll answer that question later on, Russ. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Anyway, how it turns up. I know he's dressed. This episode, he's dressed kind of like quite yuppie-ish, isn't he? He's got that. Uh, he's got that sort of he's dark bit, yeah. suit, that red tie, and a gold watch. Uh, he looks. He looks like he might might be trying to sell me something. Might be <laughs> trying to sell me a talking hoover later, maybe. But then, yeah. So Howard explains that this thing, the thing, way this works, is a thing called a CCD, which appears to just be some sort of microchip, really, as far as I could gather. I looked up how does a CCD work. And it was one of those articles that was unbelievably complicated, where it's just I couldn't really. It, it, it contained so many different terms that I just thought oh, I can't. I, I'm not going to pass this at all. The only thing that got out of it is is that of the digital cameras, there's two things. There's a, you can either have a CCD, yes, or a CMOS, yes. and the CMOS yes. is what we have in all of our everyday cameras, uh, and is is a more modern and cheaper version because it's it's cheaper to make, uses fewer components, and is lower power. Whereas the CCD is older, but was always much higher quality because it was higher power and it gave a much sharper image. So it was always used in um, sort of industrial applications, scientific applications, and astronomy as well. They use it a lot. It's in the Hubble space. Mm. The Hubble had a CCD in it. But as time has gone on, we now got to the point where CMOS has become so good that you really don't. Re there's not really much point in using a CCD anymore. So they're kind of falling out of favour now. In general. They don't use them for photography, normal photography, like or TV cameras, like uh, old Howard suggesting here, or spying mm. on men in car parks, as, uh, as, he, as mm -hmm. he demonstrates. Mm -hmm. I will say this, though. Uh, you know, 35 years is pretty good innings for technology that we're just seeing here. The fact that that little sensor that was kind of just smaller than his thumb, the fact that I had 
uh, over a million separate light sensitive points. Like, yeah. He's probably not talking about pixels in the way that we understand, but it's the same kind of thing. That's like shockingly impressive, I think, for a 1989. And it is like it is less, it is smaller than this thumb. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it is pretty impressive. I, I was I was impressed. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, except except for the fact that you know, as a as an amateur photographer in the non porn sense of the phrase amateur photographer, <laughs> the fact that they have Maggie standing in if you, you, you can see in the screen when when they're showing off how it works the fact that they have her standing behind a very bright light source so that she's completely underexposed <laughs> is quite shocking to me Russ. <laughs> and does doesn't do the technology any justice whatsoever yeah that's a that's a weird demonstration at the end there and not it's not really helping us at all is it uh, well, not really, because as I said to you, it's like we're watching this in television. Yeah. I see people move on a screen all the time, knowing that it's being recorded in a separate location. And this is live. It's an odd one, that. There's the, I suppose they're kind of showing off the fact that she can press a button and it creates a still image. But meh. Mm. press pause in your VCR and you have the same thing. Oh, the inventors of the concept of CCD, Mark, William Boyle and George E. Smith, well, they came up with it in 1970, the original concept. They won a Nobel Prize for it in 2009. Oh, 39 That's years later. Burn. Gosh. Still, though, it's nice to get one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, here's Judith with a report from Hawaii on how the farmers there are turning to a new type of food production. All of these luxuries of gastronomic life, the lobster, oyster, salmon, abalone, and the Japanese delicacy sushi, are here, courtesy of the Pacific Ocean. None of these has ever been fished or grown in the tropics before. And the reason they can now is the incredible depth of the sea immediately around these islands. Within two kilometres of here, the sea is an amazing 600 metres deep. All of the Hawaiian islands burst out of the seabed in a series of volcanic eruptions millions of years ago. And each one is in fact a steep-sided volcanic mountain which starts deep on the seabed. The deep sea waters, unlike surface waters, are rich in nutrients, but because it's dark and cold, there are very few fish. In fact, 90% of the world's fish are found in just 10% of the oceans, in those few areas where deep waters are forced up to mix with surface waters. But in the rest of the sea, water's divided into two distinct layers, warm water at the top, and cooler waters beneath. What happens is that as the sun heats those surface waters, they become less dense and rise to the top. And because they're physically different from these cooler, denser waters, the two layers don't mix. And trapped in this cool layer are nutrients from decomposed marine life. One advantage of this cooler layer is that there's 40 times the amount of nitrates and 20 times the amount of silicates and phosphates than found in the surface waters. That nutrient-rich water from 600 metres down is now being pumped to the surface and piped to this unusual seafront industrial estate. Several different businesses are buying the water. A lobster farm, seaweed for Japanese sushi, oysters, and the abalone farm, where these giant snails start off as small specks. And at this stage, they feed on plankton. By the time they've reached this stage, plankton isn't enough. They've developed an appetite for something bigger. Kelp. It's cultivated in giant million-gallon tanks of the nutrient-rich water, where it thrives, growing at an astonishing 50 centimetres a day. Divers harvest it constantly, and as a sideline, salmon are being farmed in the kelp beds. But having its own ready-mixed fertilizer isn't the only advantage of the deep water. Another advantage is its purity. When it's pumped up, it's virtually free of harmful organisms. So the delicate larvae of oysters, for example, can be raised without expensive purification techniques. But none of these luxuries could be grown without the final advantage of this deep water. It's cold at only six degrees Celsius. And when it's passed through all the farms, it's still cold enough to add a fascinating finale to this so far fishy tale. Strawberries thrive here because of that low temperature. They're being grown on Hawaii for the first time 
by passing the cold seawater through pipes at their roots. The low temperature inside the pipes condenses water vapour in the air, and the resulting fresh water, a sort of dew, irrigates these delicate fruits. Strawberries have been grown in the tropics before, but they've always been rather tasteless and bitter. It's been shown that berries grown by this rather bizarre technique have five times the sugar content of strawberries grown in normal tap water. It seems that the cooler the roots, the more sugar in the fruits. So, a very sweet end to this story. Well, Judy has absolutely hit the jackpot here, isn't she, Mark? <laughs> McCann must be fuming. She's, He's she, livid. She, He's livid. She's managed to travel across the world. So it's a, not only a sunny holiday to Hawaii, but then a slap up feast as well, including lobster, Sweet. oysters, oh, delicious abalone, yeah. and the Japanese, and the Japanese delicacy yeah. of sushi. <laughs> and all for the sum total of four hours filming. <laughs> and I'm, I'm assuming that involves maybe an hour and a half of travel time. <laughs> That's got to be the, that's got to be the most lavish uh, spread that we we've ever seen. Uh, we we see food spread out in front of them quite a lot um, in tomorrow's world to illustrate things. Yeah, but I don't think you've ever seen. And we will this. later on yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, I don't think we've ever seen one quite as <laughs> high value as that one. Maybe she's just shoplifted it from the the farms that she's visited on that day. Just just filled a handbag with oysters and lobsters and strawberries that she's uh, <laughs> for all the places she visited on, on her day out. I, mean, that, it could be, it could I never be. imagined what might be in Judith's handbag. I never really thought about <laughs> Judith being a handbag kind of person, but maybe more full me, Ross. <laughs> she probably has to shovel ice into it every morning. <laughs> all, the, all the shellfish is going to be carting around, stopping off on her commute to have a quick shock behind the uh, bike sheds. I have to say, this is something that I'd never considered at all. I mean, it's not. It's it's such a it's just it's an interesting concept. The, the basically they're just hoovering up seawater that is essentially useless because there's no fish in it because it's too deep bringing it up to land mm. and then using it for a whole range of uses that are, are, are seemingly not necessarily all that connected apart from I mean, a lot of them involve seawater but i mean not even all of them involve seawater it's, it's quite it's no. quite interesting you know it was interesting concept i think i think it was oversold by both judith and maggie who talk about how uh, it's basically changing farming. It's not really. It's changing fish farming <laughs> in a very specific location. Yeah, yeah. It's smart, isn't it? Like it, it's if there's a, if there's a particular strata of water that is particularly nutrient rich, if you can get it, then you're going to benefit from it. Um, the only thing I was wondering is but the, the the bit later on with the strawberries because I was just thinking about it now is like obviously they're not dousing the strawberries with seawater because it's got salt yeah. in it. So they must desalinate the water, and I, they no, no, never... no. What you're saying? Oh no, well, go on. Is yeah. that they run the icy cold water? That was what it was. Through, yes, through pipes, yeah. and then that pipe. Yes, and makes, then the condensation. The condensation that then. Stows yeah, on. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how many times I've seen that fucking thing. But yeah, no, you're right. That that's exactly what it is. Yeah, but the rest of it is like it's it's fish farming, you know. It's yeah. and it's 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 smart. I don't think it needs. The BBC to send Judith Han and a, a, a incredibly lucky camera crew over to Hawaii to so she can lift up a. Actually, the only thing I really gained from it, and the same same as you, is I, I don't think I'd ever truly appreciated what an abalone no. looks like no. in, in the wild, and um, it's disgusting. <laughs> The way it like it's like a giant like sentient cow. It's like tongue. a giant, yeah. Just slurps around, right. you know. It's, it's huge. Yeah, it's it, it, it is huge. It, it is it is more than like it's like a it's bigger than her hand, obviously. But it's like it's bigger than two of her hands. It's gigantic. It's and it's 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 like it's reaching out for her. It's quite horrific. Did you see the picture I put at the bottom? I did see the picture you put at the bottom, JC. Uh, uh, Russell. <laughs> so that is that is a Balthazar abalone, Mark. Right, you, yeah. that's that's a, that's from a website where you can order them online. That's a, that's also a farmed abalone. It's kind of an <laughs> interesting shape. Uh, but the do you know how much one of the, <laughs> one of those will cost? Just one. So it's about what is it? It's about the what would you say it's about size of a rugby ball, slightly smaller. Well, it, it's next to a bottle of white wine. Yeah. And it's nearly, uh, so like it's the of a yeah, it's, you know, a, a rugby ball or, or an NFL football, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think that's pretty fair. How much would one of them cost? How much would one cost? Oh my god. Two hundred and seventy-five pounds. Oh, very close. Two hundred fifty dollars. 
Oh, you've got some, quite you, pleased with that, I guess. You, some wild. It's, it's the most expensive seafood in the world, that baloney. And really? yeah, some wild examples will cost you uh, $500 a kilo. And that led me down a little, a very quick abalone uh, rabbit hole. Did you know that abalone are responsible, primarily responsible for South Africa's drug problem? <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah. So obviously, as it's a disgusting looking food, the, the Chinese are all over it. They actually love abalones. And, um, of, co- of course. <laughs> and uh, one place where they are, were prevalent in the water was in South Africa. So the Chinese organised crime would go over to South Africa and get the fishermen to poach abalones. And the thing that they would pay them in, rather than cash, was uh, the two chemicals that are the precursor chemicals in the manufacture of crystal meth. So, And then the fishermen would then uh, sell those precursor chemicals to uh, meth factories that were set up in South Africa, and uh, then that meth would then be spread around the streets. This has been going on for years. So, so, so basically, the entire crystal meth industry in South Africa is powered by Chinese criminal gangs and their hunger, uh, insatiable hunger for abalone, which I think is quite an interesting and strange connection, Mark. <laughs> I, honestly, I would never have guessed. No, it's been, it's been going since like the, the 90s, and now South Africa had, has hardly any abalone left. Uh, and just loads of people. Are, are and crazy. plenty of <laughs> yeah. lashings of meth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, not not such an innocent animal after all, Mark. That 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 giant, disgusting looking tongue yeah. tongue snail. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass. I don't think I. I, I mean, I've never had it. Uh, I've had some stupid, expensive things, including I, I've had some expensive uh, items of uh, Japanese sushi rolls. Oh yeah. Um, the, but the I've Japanese never had delicacy. abalone. <laughs> abalone. Yeah, the, sorry, the Japanese delicacy sushi or whatever it's called. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, no, I've never had a, abalone. It's funny that, and to be honest, now, now that I've seen it, I think I'll pass. It's funny that it's got, it's got baloney in the name as well, isn't it? Because it just makes you think of uh, the Americans calling the Italian sausage baloney, don't they? Baloney sandwiches. Do, yeah. And it just seems to be kind of a generic Italian sausage. Like there's nothing... The other thing is, like, a- a- abalone, it's a bit like um, sweet meats, isn't it? Where, like, the name has clearly been chosen to absolutely hide the uh, horrific truth of <laughs> what it is that you're about to consume at great cost. I do find that some expensive things aren't like what they're cracked up to be, though. I think, like, lobster, I don't think is is that great. I don't think it's worth... I like lobster, sometimes. but I don't think it's worth the money that you pay no. for it sometimes. I think no, crab's nice than yeah. lobster, and crab's much cheaper. I like I like crab as well. I mean, to be fair, when we were in in Maine, I I had lobster on a couple of occasions, and it was delicious. But it was they were basically throwing at us as we were driving through town. <laughs> it was just so prevalent and cheap. So it was like I was just like you know, yeah, of course I'll have some. Thank you very much. But in general, no, I agree with you. I think it's it's over. It's definitely overpriced for 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 what is. But yeah, oh, and I, I obviously I wanted wanted to see whether we could still get strawberries in Hawaii. So I typed in Hawaiian strawberries. It turns out that there is such a thing as a thing called the Hawaiian strawberry mark, but they don't grow it in Hawaii. Do you know why it's called the Hawaiian strawberry mark? Because, Russell, this feels like what I was talking about a second ago, so you're about to tell me that it's goat's testicles or something like that. Isn't it? <laughs> no, no. No, what, why is it called Hawaiian Because it's a strawberry that tastes like pineapples. Oh, good for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can grow them in temperate climates. I don't think you can grow them in actually in Hawaii. The result of this, do this little day out, it seems quite interesting. <laughs> I wondered whether it was still going. Turns out it's an absolute massive success, Mark. It's called the Ho- cool. Hawaiian Ocean Science and Technology Park, or Host Park. And uh, they started it in 1974. And th- actually, they, their, their original plan, they were, they, they were sucking all this water out of the sea. In some, they were trying to make energy out of it, doing some sort of thermal thing, or I don't know. Whatever okay. it was they were doing, uh, they soon realized that it wasn't very good at making energy. But then they suddenly realized that they had all of this cold, nutrient-rich water. And actually, they could do all of these much more interesting things with it. So that's why they built this park. And they've, over the years, they've invested $100 million in it. And it's, it's, the, it's now the world's uh, premier science innovation hub. It, it, ocean science innovation hub, should I add? So, uh, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. It's a 900-acre site. There's 45 different businesses and institutions on it. To be honest, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking, not, not to be cynical or anything like that, but if I, if I was an oceanographer or an ocean scientist, I absolutely would also want to pretend that Hawaii <laughs> yeah, just had yeah, to yeah. have the premiere. It's the one yeah. place I can deal with. I, uh, guys, if it was in real, I'd be going there, but it just happens to be in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But their pumps, 
So the, the pumps that sucks up the cold water from the murky depths yeah. can suck up 43,400 gallons of water per minute. Oh, okay, yeah. So you wonder if there's any water left, isn't there? You wonder if it's just <laughs> sucked up the entire Pacific by now. So, yeah, and it's all, it's all businesses you'd expect. It's like oyster businesses, abalone business is still there, I noticed. Of course, yeah. All various seafood companies, all things like that. Uh, God, yeah. I need to try some now. Yeah. Well, you'll go to Thailand soon. I'm sure they do nice seafood there, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, we're going to a town where they specialise in seafood, so I will keep an eye out and I'll report back. Oh, there you go, yeah. See if you can have an abalone. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm desperate to try one now. Yeah, no, that's the thing. Annoyingly now, I'm kind of thinking like, mm, yeah, if I see one, I'll give it a go, depending on the price. I was, um, before we move on to the next one, her statistic that was at 90% of fish are in 10% of yes, water. Yes, I looked into this, and this yeah. is true. This I is hope true. Would. It's the it's what's like it's the photic zone, pH photic. It's the part of the water that receives sunlight because the the way the food chain in the ocean works is yeah. the sunlight goes into the water, and then you've got the phytoplankton who then use the sunlight to grow and generate energy, and they're the base of they're basically the base of the, the food pyramid, and all of the other life in the ocean comes from that base so because of that all of the life is concentrated in the part of the ocean that receives light and only 10 percent of the ocean receives light so yeah she is right i, I did check that fit. In fact it is true that 90 percent of okay fish interesting is 10% of the ocean yeah that that feels slightly misleading then because i think the way she says it kind of implies that well, we're lucky that we're in the North Sea because the North Sea is one of the ten percent of the bits of, and I know I, I get it. Like it's the top layer of all oceans. Yes. Of yeah, yeah, sea. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's just me. I'm I'm reading into it, but just the way she described it, it kind of felt like there were these columns that are full of fish, and if you happen to live near one, then you were kind of you know, <laughs> um, no wonder there's a cod war because you know the other side of Atlantic, <laughs> of Iceland, like, there's nothing for as far as the eye can see. Anyway, okay, thank you. That that's that's good to know. Anything else? No, that's good. Flying through this today. My clubs, please, Caddy. Ah, that's better. Now, this powered trolley is what, what, <laughs> what every trendy golfer will have on the links this spring. And if I start to dismantle it, you can see what makes it so special. Inside here, there's uh, an ordinary battery, but there's no sign of any motor. There's certainly no drive shaft and no axle. So what's propelling it along? Well, there are, in fact, two motors inside here, one in each of these wheels. And each of them is powered by that ordinary 12-volt battery because the motors themselves are just one and a half inches thick. And they drive this system of gears and clutches around a short shaft where the wheel hub can be attached. The result is a self-propelling wheel which can be bolted onto practically anything that you like. Each wheel produces one-third of a horsepower and two of these can carry a full-grown man. Now, because the unit is so small and lightweight and completely sealed, it's already turning up in some fairly unexpected places. Take, for instance, this unlikely-looking high wire act. This is, in fact, a corrosion detector. And this little vehicle can travel about five kilometres a day. And it's controlled by this radio link down here on the ground, which means that I can stop it and send it back the other way and can vary the speed as much as I want. Incidentally, the sensors are in that uh, brown tube on the right-hand side, and the single-wheel motor which is what drives it along, is on the left-hand side. And there are enough gears inside there to make sure that it'll cope with the steepest of gradients between pylons. Now, the CGB hope that it may pick up corrosion earlier than the present technique of spotting it using helicopters. Now, the wheel motor is even being tried out at sea, where one company is now developing an autopilot system for yachts, where the motor down here is controlled by a navigation computer, which automatically drives the ship's steering mechanism. Well, who said there's no mileage in reinventing the wheel? Howard. Do you think there's any reason why boats have such large steering wheels, Mark? Is it just tradition? Do, do you need more le leverage to turn a... Well, I, I, turn something that was what I was assuming. Yeah, it was like, I, I can't imagine... Well, no, you know, he's even just like a massive galleon. Like, there's no... You can't imagine there were many gears between the wheel and the rudder, so you, wouldn't, you would literally need to kind of lever it around. That's the only reason I can think of. I think these days... Um, yeah, I, I, 100% it's an affectation, to use that word again. It's completely um, nonsensical, isn't it? Because, like, it's, there's, yeah, there's no way it's not, there's not some kind of support involved in that. Yeah. But it just looks cool. Yeah. It looks cool. And, you know, if you're going to wear the cap, because you're going to wear the cap, <laughs> you might as well have a big giant wheel that you turn. <laughs> yeah. Do you think the modern ones have got really big airbags in the middle of them? <laughs> 
I didn't, but I do now. <laughs> yeah, wheels, Mark. Wheels. I don't know. This is something that I just hadn't really considered. The, uh, that wasn't a thing. A wheel with a with its own motor with motor its own in motor it. in it. I'm surprised yeah. that that's, this is something that's, that's only really been thought of in 1989. Um, but maybe that's because you know we live in we live in the magical future of segways. Which uh, obviously famously have their <laughs> their voters in the we wheel, do, don't Mark, we? aren't they, Mark? So, of course, of course, they do. Yeah. So, so we can't, I can't conceive of a, of a world pre Segway because they're such a no sort of you know society changing product that it's very e- epochal defining. Yeah, 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 it's difficult for me to envisage the time. Yeah, all these people trying to pretend that we live in the new Carolinian era, you know, <laughs> having been Elizabethans, like no, no, I'm a Segway, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. We see McCann demonstrating the wonders of of what you could possibly do. Although he doesn't mention the Segway, obviously it's not been invented yet. But all the wonders you can do with with. A... <laughs> to be fair, you can't really criticise him for that, right? No, no, <laughs> it's no, not been no. Invented. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean no, yeah, he, yeah. he does demonstrate the the second best thing, which is the motorised golf cart. Uh, not a golf cart, sorry, golf golf caddy, isn't it? Golf, golf caddy, caddy. Yeah. motorised golf caddy. Does a comedy slip up with it at the beginning? Do you think that's del- is that deliberate or accidental? Is he is that? No, I think it's deliberate. Yeah. He actually sounds slightly disappointed that he did it. Yeah, <laughs> is that just to prove that he's not a golfer? He doesn't want to be. Well, that- oh, do you think? Do you think he's trying to send the message that like, uh, don't worry, all, all you cool guys who think I'm one of you, don't worry, I'm not really a golfer. I'm just pretending to be for this bit. You think he? You think he's like. He's three layers deep. <laughs> well, you could, you could mistake it for a golfer. He enjoys a foreign. Ho- oh yeah, he enjoys a foreign holiday. Yeah. Wears a lot of knitwear. Yeah. Slack. He loves. Yeah, slack. loves a slack. <laughs> could be mistaken for a golfer, and that's just him. You know, <laughs> laying it out there. He's just too mm. too cool for golf. Well, he does. He does. He does yeah. say well, the, the latest trendy golfer or something. Yeah. He, he did say that. Yeah, which maybe is the first warning sign that he's not really a golfer. <laughs> of course, he only, he only wears the one glove because he's such a jack at the fact. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? You can get if you could get special Jacko golfing gloves with diamonds and studded in them. Might improve improve your grip on the club, mightn't it? A diamond studded. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Well, I suppose the, the diamonds have to be on the inside, though, wouldn't they? Yeah. Oh, oh are they, yeah. were they not all round on Jacko? Were they only on, were they only on the outside? Oh, I, don't know. I, I, I assume they were all, all, all over. Yeah, maybe they were. Yeah. Do you think Vic, do you think oh, Vic and Bob's film about Michael Jackson's gloves ever going to come out? This this long delayed film, I don't know. Do you, do you think it's also about golf? Oh, yeah, it might be. Yeah, yeah. So as well as golf caddies, McCann also demonstrates that it could be used in a boat, as I mentioned at the beginning, and yep. a corrosion detector. And mm. weirdly, I, obviously, I when I first watched this, I went, "Why is this corrosion detector up near the ceiling of the of the studio?" I only realised at subsequent watches it's because it's a corrosion detector for electrical wires that go yes, between. But that doesn't that, go between pylons. That doesn't explain though. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I, I understood what it was showing us. I didn't realise you necessarily didn't think that. It was like, <laughs> but you are right to question what... Because the thing is, it cuts to a very wide shot, McCann, and, he, and it, the little model, or it's probably the real thing, actually, it's about... Yeah, it's the real thing. Five metres, six metres? Yeah, you've looked yeah. at the picture, yeah. It could have been one metre off the ground, and it, it would have explained it. Because you need to see it <laughs> moving. You don't need to see the fact that it's high up the ground. No, no, but if, if, it was, if, it was, if it was only one metre off the ground, then somebody could have got electrocuted by the electricity going through it, Mark. So oh, I see, Russell. So, I'm so sorry. You're absolutely right. <laughs> and, and, and God knows every child would have tried to throw their Frisbee <laughs> yeah, at it. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, okay, fair enough. I'm sorry, I'm being silly. That always annoyed me, that, that famous advert where the kid throws the Frisbee into the electrical substation. Yeah. Because it's wedged between... In, in that advert, the it's wedged between ceramic insulators yeah, yeah. and the Frisbee's made of plastic. So the kid wouldn't get electrocuted. As long as they didn't touch any of the wires, no. the kid wouldn't get electrocuted. <laughs> but also, as a result of that public information film, I, I, I genuinely feared the ceramic insulators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, yeah, yeah. I would look, at, I would look up at a pylon and I would of... see those. Yeah. And I and I assumed that they were the most dangerous parts, not the cables with electricity <laughs> running through them. So I think I think I'm, I'm not sure that worked quite as well as they thought. Obviously, as I said, the, the motor with the wheel wheel in it is. I mean, they're everywhere these days. I mean, not only segways, yeah. but you've got your you've got the um, what's it called? I wrote it down because I didn't know what it was called before. The one wheel, which is that one. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Wheel. yeah. And yeah. the ones that they, they call hoverboards, but actually are technically called self-balancing scooters. They've tried to do it with cars. And actually, turns out that Ferdinand Porsche, he had a racing car, which he raced in Vienna in 1897. And that had motors in the hubs of the wheels. It was an electric car with motors in the hubs of the wheels. And the first cars that he made for the Porsche company 
So did you say 1911? 1897. 1897, sorry. And, the f- and when he started the Porsche company, the first cars that he made all had electric motors. It was a battery-powered cars with electric motors in the wheels. So how far we've come. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the problem is... And, and, 102 years and in, in, in modern in modern times they've tried to make there've been loads of concept cars like Mercedes have made one and Nissan's made one there've been loads of concept cars where they've tried putting the motors in the wheels rather than having because obviously electric cars at the moment but they've got a motor in them like a regular car and it goes yeah. out to the wheels or in the regular way that a car does but they can't put them in the wheels because they've discovered that if you put all the weight in the wheels it absolutely ruins the handling of the car because the weight's all in the wrong place and you and you, you can't get can't get balanced out by the suspension and shock absorbers so that's why you can't get you can't get cars these days with the motors in the wheels mark that is useful yeah i understand yeah. okay that makes sense so yeah so actually porsche was an absolute idiot 120 oh, 28 years ago what a yeah. fool yeah obviously soon we realize the error of his ways yeah obviously the one thing where it has taken off though mark can you think of one thing where it's really taken apart from the segway obviously where have, having the, the motor in the hub has really taken off uh airport monorails <laughs> ah, bi- bicycles <laughs> The electric bicycle. Oh, oh, of course, the electric bicycle. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, slightly, slightly different. Good. The ones that McCann shown us here are only very little wheels, but it's the same concept, basically, but on a bigger wheel with a with a smaller hub. Yeah. So yeah, the electric bicycle goes from strength to strength, and that's that runs in a similar system. Although I did notice the the, the famous Dutch bicycle company Van Moof, which uh, yeah, has gone bust. Which I'll shot gone under. Yeah. And yeah. And apparently. There's big trouble because you can you unlock them using your phone, and if Van Moof closes their servers down, and it's not supported, it, then you can't unlock your bike. You unlock your bike. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I was speak to someone because when they said when I was this point because I think that they're very lovely looking bikes, uh, and and they were saying, do you know what? The other thing is, um, all their kind of bits and bobs were uh, proprietorial, so you couldn't even fix it yourself. <laughs> So, because I was thinking, like, oh, I'll get one for cheap. And like, no, it's literally pointless. If, if they're not there to support your your bike, like, it's just, yeah. God, what a, what a what a world we live in. Yeah. Thank God I've got my Segway yeah, charging up there absolutely. for tomorrow, so I'm They'll, they'll never yeah. go past Monday, Mark. I mean, no, the millions upon millions they've sold, they're set for life. Yeah. And they're always innovating, always coming out with new segways. I mean, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> I, I, every year I trade my old one in and get, a, you know, get whatever the newest one on the block is. Of course you do, and of course they pay you to yeah, do yeah, that, yeah. don't they? Well, they they, they throw yeah. in a f- uh, new a free set of uh, knee and elbow pads and uh, helmets to wear. <laughs> of course with they it. do, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> God knows you're burning your way through the, your your current stock, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, all, all those yeah, all, all those stunts. Alive. Do, it? <laughs> right. Anyway, next, shall we? Yeah. Soft cheese. It's one of the foods we've heard a lot about recently, particularly since the Department of Health have advised pregnant women not to eat it. The reason is this bacterium, listeria, and the rare but dangerous disease it causes, listeriosis. If it's such a problem, though, then how come we haven't been told about it before? And why is it that soft cheeses are being singled out? Well, it's only in the last decade that the close link between food and listeria has been discovered, especially after two serious outbreaks, one in California in 1985, the other in Switzerland in 1987, that between them claimed over 80 lives. Listeria is everywhere in the environment, even in a number of foods. But it only becomes a risk when conditions allow it to multiply and reach high levels. Now, this doesn't often happen, but it can in certain cheeses. But it's easy to forget that cheese is itself the product of bacteria. The whole cheese-making process relies on just two ingredients, milk and this, a special starter culture of live lactic acid bacteria. It's these organisms that convert the mild curds into cheese, and in doing so, they produce so much lactic acid that normally no other bacteria can compete. And that's why... Hard cheese like this is such a good way of storing milk nutrients. But there are a number of ways that the risk of contamination can increase. Now, of course, pasteurisation may help by reducing the number of bacteria to begin with, but even with pasteurised milk, there could be a problem. If that acidity in the cheese is allowed to drop, then competitive organisms may start to grow. The process of mould ripening is used, for instance, in blue cheeses, and certain soft cheeses, like this brie, where the rind is actually a layer of mould. But as this mould grows, it slowly reduces the acidity, and this means that bacteria like listeria can begin to multiply. Even so, there's very little risk except to people with weakened immune systems, such as the very young, the very old, or pregnant women. 
There is hope, though. In the future, soft cheeses could be made as safe as hard cheeses. Genetic engineers at the Food Research Institute in Norwich have recently managed to engineer bacteria that can fight off competition by producing their own antibiotics. Now, there's nothing new in certain cheese bacteria producing antibiotics, and one of the best known is nicin, which for some years has been a natural food preservative. But the Norwich team have found and decoded the piece of genetic information that actually makes nicin, and they've successfully transferred this to other types of cheese bacteria. Here, two bacterial colonies have received the genetic information to produce nicin, and as a result, they have flourished and prevented the growth of other bacteria around them. This same package of genetic information also contains the genes to protect the bacteria against their own antibiotics. The Norwich team claim that as long as the cheesemakers know what strains of bacteria they have, the genetic engineers can convert the bacteria to nicin-producing forms without changing the character of the cheese. So one day, most soft cheeses could make their own natural food preservative, providing an extra defence against listeria contamination and enabling everybody to enjoy soft cheeses in safety. Now, Mark, you wrote something in the notes which uh, actually took me aback here, yeah, Mark. Very rarely that I'm shocked by anything you write in, the, in our shared notes <laughs> document. OK. Uh, but you wrote, I don't really care for cheese all that much. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, what the hell did I write in my notes that would have shocked you to your core? Uh, uh, no, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't really care for cheese all that really? much. That, that, that really yeah. surprises me. You, you seem like the sort of person that would enjoy a, a, a nice bit of cheese. No? What, what don't you like about cheese? Uh, too cheesy? Taste or texture? <laughs> I, I just don't enjoy it all that much. Really? It's, um, yeah. I, 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 with the exception of, like, beer, I, I don't think I enjoy kind of fermented foods. Really? It's a real struggle for me at the moment, Russ, because at the moment my wife make makes kimchi. both homemade kombucha and sauerkraut. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, not sauerkraut, um, kimchi. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. So, like, the, ha the house is Absolutely. stocked to the rafters with fermenting uh, material. Away. Yeah, yes, literally, they, they, they will sit there bubbling. I, 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 you know, I'm delighted for her. I know she enjoys it. But to me, it's like, you know, obviously cheese is, is, is not quite as egregiously fermented as uh, kombucha or kimchi. But uh, no, I've, I've never, never loved it, actually. I, I, and it, it's always one of those things that makes me feel odd. Because, like, you'll go out for a lovely meal, you'll be with some good friends or a family or something like that. And, uh, like, most people will, like, a there'll be a little tear in their eye and they'll get all kind of clammy hand <laughs> handed with excitement at the idea of a cheese board coming at the end. It's, like, it's almost like, oh, in many ways we're only here to have the cheese board at the end. It's like, get the... F no, thank you very much. <laughs> um, not that I like desserts all that much, but like the cheese board, get yeah, no, <laughs> not at all. So no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really a cheese person. Uh, have you, have you tried the? I mean, are have you? You, have you, you don't strike me as a cheese lover. I've, I've, oh yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, have you tried? Yeah, have you tried, have you tried the? You, have you, you tried you, the kombucha and the? Uh, what was the other one? Oh, kimchi. Uh, kimchi the yes, I have. Yes. Oh yeah. I've, it's I've, not I've, that, I've like, never I, tried. I've never tried either. I don't know what they taste like. What they taste like? Malt. Fermented stuff. No, well, you've had sauerkraut, right? Yeah, so it's kind of like that, you know, that oh. kind of, that you know, you know that kind of Vinegary. strong, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, so that's kind of basically what you know, kimchi is a kimchi. So kombucha is a kind of a. Well, I don't want to sound like I'm throwing kombucha under the bus, but it's kind of a it's kind of a vinegary drink, yeah. really. Although you know, people obviously flavour it with stuff, and um, yeah, it's just 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 really genuinely like it just leaves me cold. Actually, worse than that, you know, it, I just, I actively don't enjoy it. Now, I kind of feel like I'm missing out at times because there are quite a lot of cuisines that have that kind of taste and texture as like an exciting key part of what they do. And it just puts me right off. I suppose cheese kind of falls into that category for me, which is like, I want to say like, oh, I get it. Like, I get it. I get it. It was just not for me. It's like, I don't get, I actually don't get it. You know, I, I genuinely don't get cheese. But obviously, I am in the minority, and so therefore, when I say I don't get it, that does not mean there is nothing to get. It means that I, I personally, I'm very aware of the fact that there is absolutely something to get, and there is a part of me that just cannot accept whatever it is. Now, I, I mean, I mean, I've had when we were in Lisbon, we went to a lovely place where we had uh, we had a kind of a wine and cheese tasting session where we enjoyed wines from all over Portugal and you know myself and Josie are big fans of Portuguese wine it's really good it's incredibly tasty and varied 
And the cheese is a bit for me, like, no, 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 I'll go along with it. And I did enjoy some, but it tends to be more the sheep's cheese, which is kind of a bit uh, nicer to me. <laughs> but, it, but, it, but, I, but I think that a cheese aficionado would probably say that it's the least cheesy cheese. So... <laughs> Even weird. I've got a, I've got a friend over here called Jules, and she is quite happy to eat. Che- likes cheese in its normal room like state, but she yeah. absolutely can't stand melted cheese. See, I will have melted cheese and stuff. <laughs> melted, I see. Melted cheese is surely nice. Is the nicer form of cheese, isn't it? Yeah, like I, I like a good pizza. Yeah. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I don't feel like I can throw Jules in the bus, but I will use her as a human shield. That's a weird. <laughs> she's a weird freak, Russ. <laughs> Yeah, no, I love cheese, Mark. And I have to say, the amount of cheese that's demonstra- that Howard uses to demonstrate this piece is truly astonishing. Like, because you, you, because it, I don't think there's ever been this much cheese in one Tomorrow's World segment ever. Like, there, there is assuming that all of that cheese is is actual cheese and not prop cheese made of plastic. That giant, presumably, what it is, cheddar, maybe the giant one. That might be a yeah. piece of plastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It does look a bit like it might be a big piece of plastic. But all the other cheeses do look fairly authentic. There's got to be about... Well, the soft cheese is absolutely... There's got to be about 500 yeah. quid's worth of cheese there, at least, for, or grand's worth of cheese. I was going to say hundreds of pounds worth of yeah. cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's been sitting under those studio lights. Just sitting so out. So they can't just pop it back <laughs> yeah, in there. That's exactly They're going to have to eat it all. Yeah. They're gonna have, they're gonna have to, after the programme, they're all going to have to sit down and eat all of that cheese. I mean, how much wine is the crew going to have to get through to polish that off? <laughs> They're going to have to uh, smash the glass of the emergency port uh, selection. <laughs> Hopefully, Judith's brought back a lot of duty free, maybe from uh, from her holiday. But oh, do you reckon she's actually coming back tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why they got the cheese there for this. <laughs> oh no, she's in the studio, isn't she? So that can't. Be... Oh, she, maybe, maybe she's just got back. Oh, she might. She got back yeah, yeah, this, yeah, this yeah, afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Although usually you said you reckon this this particular cheese segment is is pre recorded. What makes you think that? So uh, the, the the most exciting thing about this segment, I think, for both of us, is that Howard walks through the studio, stopping off at a podium to carry on talking about uh, the issue here, which is I, I I tried to warn people about cheese, but they wouldn't listen to me. The dangers of cheese, Russ. Yeah. For children, old people, and pregnant people, which I'm suggesting at any one point in time is probably more than half the population of Britain. <laughs> uh, so he's moving from body to body as, as, as he's explaining, explaining what the issue is. And at the end, there's this amazing shot, which is clearly deliberate, where we see yeah. he has walked, he is at his eighth and final podium, and it is the most podia we believe tomorrow's world have it's, used. It's got so to be far, every, they've got to drag to seeing every podium out of this step forward, haven't they? Except, and I, I, hopefully we'll see this later on, there is a shot later on, it might be when Howard is vacuuming, where you can see a podium in the background, and it does not contain cheese, it contains the camera from the very first segment. Yeah. And unless there is a ninth podium, uh, I'm suggesting that the camera stuff was live, the Hoover stuff was live, but the podium shot was, uh, this this segment was recorded before but, the program. McCann was, McCann was using podiums as well. He had his wheels and stuff on podiums. That's true. Oh, sorry, yeah, that's, it wasn't the camera. It was the wheels. Ah. That was what it was. It's the wheels. You see the wheels still on the podium turning in the background. Yeah. I knew it was something. Um, and so I would suggest that was live, the McCann bit was live, but not the Howard stuff. Just, just, I do not yeah, believe they have a ninth. No, I don't. Yeah, they're not that podium rich. <laughs> But they're clearly, they're clearly proud of the podium situation. I mean, because... Cause, right, cause it, Russ, no, The way it's shot... Eight is amazing. How, how yeah. it's very off to the right of the screen, and we just get full yep. full podium. Yep. Russ, I started doing a visible high five. <laughs> it was amazing. What, what, a, what an incredible shot. We kind of needed it, because the this piece is goes on for quite a long time. Yes. It's a health piece. And it's a health okay. piece. And you, you, I you think know, listeners like, know our, yeah. our view on health items. Some of the podiums are unnecessary. I don't know why he needs to go to a podium covered in... Oh, 100%. Does, why does he need to go to a podium covered in cheese and then go to another podium covered in cheese later yeah, on? Yeah, twice. He goes to, why he can't he just go back podium. to the old... Yeah. I, 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 you can never go back. Yeah. That's the point. He always needs to be going forwards. That's true. Through, through, yeah. Yeah, yeah, through time and space. So well, it's the danger of listeria, Mark. Mm. Listeria being a bacteria that acts as a parasite in the cells of mammals. I didn't know this. People bang on about food poisoning all the time. I'm always eating food that hasn't been cooked properly or is out of date and things like that. And I've never done me any harm. You know, I, probably the huge number of Donna kebabs I've eaten in my life has meant I have a very, very <laughs> cast iron constitution. You're inured. Yeah. So I always did sort of, whenever people talk about food poisoning, I, you're the definition of <laughs> what doesn't kill you makes you strong. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would assume that all food poisoning things are overblown. 
But uh, I looked into this. And the, the listeria actually is actually really dangerous. The disease is called listeriosis if you if you catch it, but it causes sepsis, meningitis, and encephalitis, or a combination of those two called meningoencephalitis, which is really bad. But it has a fatality rate of twenty to thirty percent, mm. which is pretty high, isn't it? Um, mm. So then I looked. I looked. I found a list of the top 15 worst ever food poisoning outbreaks. Nine of them are listeria, Mark. In 2017, so the, mo- the worst ever food poisoning incident was in 2017 in South Africa again, but it wasn't abalone because they've all gone to China. It was contaminated deli meats, and that infected 1,060 people and killed 216 of them. Wow. Yeah. So there's no messing about. So, yes, I can see why... They are concerned about listeria, uh, and it's not, and perhaps it's not, you know, it's not as lightweight a subject as as, as you and only you <laughs> think. <laughs> All the comedy cheese and podiums uh, might suggest. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I've had food poisoning to the best of my knowledge twice in my life, and I will say this: you you know when you have food poisoning. One of them was when I was in Morocco, and the other was uh, when I was in Sicily, and I had a bad clam in an otherwise epically good clam linguine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you 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 know, and there's no two ways about it. It's like you know you've got food poisoning, especially with the clam one, because that was quite recently. I, it's relatively fresh in my mind. It's like I vomited several times, and then clearly when the one bad clam came out of me, it's like a switch went off. I was like, oh, well, I'm all right now. I'll have another linguine. It was hours later, but like, yeah, I would have eaten another one. It, it, is a, it, is a, it, it is a very unpleasant thing. It didn't put you off clams for life then? No, not at all. In fact, I've recommended the restaurant quite recently because it was really good. But like, ah, you get a bad clam, you get a bad clam. Oh, Ross, they had this amazing thing. It was kind of grilled oyster with uh, kind of um, kind of um, like an Italian meat lardons just on a skewer. And, you know, so the, the oh, oh, man, I, honestly, no word of a lie. It was just sitting there in the sun with my wife, glass of white wine, these skewer things. And I was just thinking, like, holy shit, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> and uh, and the, the, uh, honestly, clam linguine would recommend it. <laughs> just, you know, maybe... Leave two to the side because the odds are, you know, you you probably dodged a bullet. Yeah, they leave the shells on it, which is what, what I don't understand. Shells. When you buy, when you get shell, when you get shellfish, yes, you get they shellfish do. Well, they, yeah, they leave the shells on it, right? You can't eat the shells, so no, like, that that would be that but to it's, me. It's, it's it's to prove that it didn't come out of a. Can. That's to me. It's like if you ordered a carbonara, they just chuck the eggs in yep. and don't take the shells out. <laughs> like, that, that's exactly the same thing, surely. Do you know what? <laughs> I, annoyingly, I can't quite disagree with you. <laughs> yeah. I've always thought that. Yeah, it's always, it's always, it's always, <laughs> I've always thought it's always that. Been, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I need to take up with an Italian next time I'm over there. Please do. I, I, was, I was just thinking there. Do you, I'm worried that our listeners think that we go on holiday too much. <laughs> <laughs> We're always talking about all these foreign countries we've been to. That's true. We're That's worse true. than we can. <laughs> Russ or Mark abroad <laughs> or in a small European town. Tick every time, eh, Russ? Thanks to you. Um, yeah, well, you know, well, I, you know, it's not that we go on holiday a lot. We don't. We fucking do this a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it's, it's more that we just enjoy them. So there yeah. we go. Stop, don't judge us. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetical listener Russell's just made up. Yeah. Well, we, we've got high rolling listeners anyway. I know, we, I know that, don't we? That's true. God bless them. But anyway, yeah, so this, this, uh, this advice for pregnant women to avoid... Uh, soft cheese as opposed to hard cheese uh, hard cheese um, hard cheese did you to avoid soft cheese that was posted up in maternity wards all around Britain by the chief medical officer in the 80s and it did indeed cause a sharp drop in the number of pregnant women getting uh, listeriosis so it was a really good success alright that sounds pretty convincing yeah, then, yeah. yeah the Americans have got a different way of avoiding it in that they well they don't have is it unpasteurized they don't they don't let yeah they, it's, it's like you can't you, you this is bad yeah, it's bad isn't it? you, you, you can't yeah 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 you can't you, you want a nice you want a nice uh, manky French cheese you want to import that into America you yeah. won't be able to it has to be pasteurized so for that reason the Americans do actually generally have a slightly well, well not slightly a quite considerably lower rate of listeriosis than the Europeans but on the flip side of that uh, all of their cheese is horrible. So, <laughs> well, I mean that's the thing, isn't it? <laughs> is that, you know, now I like a a kind of a craft sleeve chi- uh, oh, yeah, cheese yeah. slice on my burger because yeah, yeah. it's not no, cheese. No, no. But I even I would argue if, if you require your cheese to be individually sliced and wrapped, you probably are not going to be getting the best cheese. <laughs> I, I remember once when uh, when we were kids, 
my mum once packed some cheese sandwiches for a trip. I think she was in a hurry or something. She used those those slices, but she she, she didn't know, she didn't realise they were wrapped in plastic. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so they still had the plastic uh, still had the plastic wrap on them mm. when we bit into them. Anyway, yeah. So, but now, so obviously Howard here he talks about genetically modifying some bacteria to that would have this niacin in them, which is which is still used as a as a food additive, like it's a naturally occurring antibacterial agent that other bacteria produce. <clears throat> so you can use yeah. that to prevent the listeria from growing. But he talks about them uh, genetically modifying other bacteria to produce it. And I think probably not, no one likes genetic modification. Uh, one thing I noticed about early, well, not early, but tomorrow's world generally around this era and before, is they talk about genetic modification stuff as if, it's, as if no one has any concerns about it, as if it's like qualms. the future. Yeah, no qualms about it. Yeah. yeah. It's just, oh, this is what we can do in the future because it's the future. Whereas I, I think probably but, people have gone off of it in modern times, haven't they? Really, the you know, whole idea, generally as a rule. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I think it's um, it, it's two things. It, it's it's one is uh, I think I think the spirit of tomorrow's world until until the like the, the the later eras, the spirit of tomorrow's world is always to err on the side of enthusiasm about new things. New things can bring new solutions. And, and which I've always quite liked. I quite like their kind of general enthusiasm. Like every now and then you, you'll get a ribald comment from Howard where he'll, you know, stick his tongue in his cheek and kind of, you know, roll his eyes a bit. But in general, it's like the future's exciting and it's full of possibilities. I think what has happened since 1989, even since 1989, was that, you know, a, a level of cynicism has seeped into society because frankly, not even you and I, but even like the generation younger than us, the reality of the future has been not as promised. And I think the worst thing that happened to G- genetically modified foods was the Monsanto thing where, uh, um, you know, I don't want to libel anyone. And this is just my recollection. It was like, it, it turned out that they weren't really genetically modifying food necessarily to overcome disease or to propagate more yield in a harvest, but to die after a year so you have to basically open a subscription <laughs> yeah. packet yeah. a yeah. subscription, subscription package yeah. to kind of get new seeds yeah yeah, yeah. A- and that was a bit like oh hang on a minute no yeah don't like that yeah so so i couldn't find any genetically modified bacteria being used in these sorts of things but what i have found mark what they do what they've got now is even better oh it's called in capital letters Listex P100, Ooh. and what they've basically they've they've found a virus, Mark, the 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 enemy of the bacteria, the virus. They found a okay. virus, and it absolutely hates listeria. So you just so you you just spray it on your on whatever on your camembert or whatever, and it seeks out the listeria, infects it, and makes it explode. So yeah, oh, yeah okay. Yeah. It's, it's so you end up with fizzy green. <laughs> well, no, it, it, so it just kills it. So it just kills it off before it can even okay. to take take it. So they've they, it's been approved by the EU and the, uh, the US, and they, they've they've tried spraying it on everything. You've got raw, and we're certain this is safe. Yep, yep, salmon fillets, catfish fillets, fruit, surface ripened, ripened soft cheese, hot dogs. Cooked and sliced turkey, breast meat, smoked salmon, mixed seafood, chocolate milk, mozzarella, cheese brine, iceberg lettuce, cabbage, and sausage. Spray mm. it with Listex P100, and your listeria problems are gone. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's basically like listeria AIDS, but worse. Cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've got the virus. <laughs> <laughs> Covered it. Covered it. Yeah. Welcome news. Now, it may not be the most serious problem facing airlines at the moment, but keeping planes clean is an important part of keeping them flying efficiently and can save millions of pounds. Here's a report from Anna Walker. washing doesn't just make the plane look good, it actually makes them cheaper to run. Even in wet weather, it's worth doing properly. The trouble is, they're not exactly an easy shape to clean. There are various bits that stick out that could easily be damaged. Different airlines have tried all sorts of methods, from the time-consuming bucket and brush to hydraulic platforms and water jets. If only you could take a plane to the equivalent of a car wash. Here's the answer. Bring the car wash to the plane. Two people would normally take eight hours to wash this plane. Now it's done in two. The machine can also polish, something which took too long to do in the past. The brushes can cope with anything from a light plane to a jumbo, reaching up to 95% of the surface area. These 
Both rods are sensors, which make sure that the brushes stay at the correct pressure and distance from the aircraft's body. If by any chance they should exceed a preset level of pressure, then there's a computer in the base of the machine which will make them adjust automatically so the fuselage won't be damaged. There are also a couple of tanks over here, one of which contains detergent and the other is full of polish. And there's plenty in there to wash at least two of these planes. regular washing and polishing has extended the time between repainting the aircraft from every three to every five years. But that's not all. A clean polished surface presents less resistance through the air, so a plane can fly much more easily. This airline expects to make fuel savings of up to £1 million per year across its fleet of 55 aircraft. So at least there's one aviation cost that isn't rising. Just when we think we've seen all of the presenters, Mark, another <laughs> one pops up out of the blue. Like a whack-a-mole. Yes. Yeah. Anna Walker. Now, I, I recognised her uh, mm -hmm. from the telly, but I didn't. I had mm -hmm. no idea that she'd ever presented uh, Tomorrow's World. In fact, I, did, I, could, no, I don't really remember where I did recognise her from, Mark, but obviously looking into it, it's the most famous thing she was, in, was, I think you called it, Wish You Were Here. Wish You Were Here. Yes. I remember from Wish You Were Here with Judith Chalmers. Yeah. Yes. But obviously... We, she only works in programmes with Judiths. <laughs> yeah, involving aeroplane travel. Yes, yeah, true. Yeah. But the, yeah, this is sli this slightly predates Wish You Were Here, or her stint on it anyway. So I, I'm, I think this is her first television presenting job. I don't know if necessarily this is her first ever episode, but this is Tomorrow's World is her first ever television pre oh, presenting wow. job because she yeah. she uh, started out as a researcher and scriptwriter on Tomorrow's World. So I think they must have did, you know oh. bumped her up. Gosh. Bumped her up to do some presenting work. I decided that she's mm. you know, quite quite photogenic, isn't she? Yeah. yeah. She's pretty good. She's decent. Um, with one exception, which we'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> we'll do a minute. Born, in, born on the 4th of December 1962 in Sheffield, which means Ooh, she's 27 in this episode and 62 yeah, yeah. these days. Uh, she, went, she started off going to school in York, but then she attended the British school in the Netherlands, Mark, from the 1979 to 1981. <laughs> I know exactly where there is one. Wow. I've been past there. Do you? Where is it? It's uh, down near a junk shop that I yeah. frequent and, a oh. and a, near an old tram yard. She does look kind of like she could be a bit Dutch, doesn't she? she there's a lot of Dutch people who look a bit like her. She I does, wonder whether yeah. she's got some Dutch yeah, in her she family. She cycles. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if she's got some Dutch. I can't find out if she's got any Dutch in her family. But anyway, she, she watched the, the, the seminal. The Van der Volkers. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. She, <laughs> she watched the seminal uh, David Attenborough series Life on Earth as a teenager. And she went, I want, I want to do that. So with, with a remarkable amount of um, sort of drive, she went and studied zoology at Bristol University. And the reason she did Just that like Chris because, The reason she did that is because the BBC Natural History Unit is based in Bristol. In Bristol, yeah. Uh, so that was that, I guess the remarkable amount of um, forward I mean I certainly never did that amount of uh, had that amount of forethought when I was <laughs> applying for university. No, can, can, thinking can, what to do in the future. I, I, I wonder if listeners <laughs> I wonder if listeners will appreciate just how accidental this podcast is for us and, and how we never planned it. <laughs> as 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 difficult as, as much as they would struggle to believe that this was a pure happenstance. <laughs> but yeah, obviously, yeah. So after tomorrow as well, she, she should have stayed tomorrow as well for very long. I don't think. Um, I think perhaps she got poached by ITV for Wish You Were Here, and she did all of the kind of big money transfer. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Did did the action orientated sort of stuff that. Like bungee jumping, jumping, and uh, windsurfing, and things like that. Yeah, the sort of things that mm. that Judith Chalmers, Young Judith Chalmers things, might yeah. look a bit yeah. silly doing. Yeah. Right, did Judith Chalmers do a bungee jumping? Yeah. <laughs> no, she might break. <laughs> is, she, is Judith Chalmers still alive? Oh gosh, let's go with yes. I'm down. I haven't seen her for years. All right. You'd imagine oh, she might have died. You might have got news to somebody. skin cancer, wouldn't you? You'd assume. I feel like I kind of feel like she might have died a couple no, of years she's ago. She's still alive, Mark. 
She no, oh, they go for that. She is eighty-eight years old. Hey, blimey! <laughs> After that tough life, I can't oh. believe she's still going. That's, that's the most neo-Nazi of all ages, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, good point. But yeah, so then she she then did loads of sports stuff, and she's a freelancer in the nineties. Did lots of sports stuff for the, both BBC and Sky. I think she did the Olympics once or twice. Interestingly, when did Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones get married? Was it early 2000s, wasn't it? Something like that? Uh, or, or very, very late 90s, like 99. Well, whatever it was, Anna Walker was the uh, maid of honour at that wedding. 99. Really? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Remind me, how did he cure himself of throat cancer? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I can't, I don't know. Has he, uh, how did he cure himself? <laughs> I might be making this up from uh, fresh cloth, but did, did, didn't he claim cuddlingus as what? No, 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 no. Cuddlingus is what caused it. Oh, it was a cause, but it was not the cause and cure. <laughs> oh, right, okay. I don't know. I don't know whether Anna Walker was involved in any way. <laughs> but, yes. I don't think we throw her under the bus like that. <laughs> no, probably not. She, obviously, she's also married, and she moved, her, her whole family, they moved to a 15th century village in Switzerland called Val de Anivier's. And they run Frozen Action, a property company that does chalet management, rentals, and sales. Cool. Yes. And obviously, I put a photograph of her at the bottom of this. Is, this is from yes. interview in 2016 in Daily Express. A uh, photograph of her at the bottom there. She's golfing. She, yeah, it looks like she's wearing golfing and guitar, doesn't she? And then you pointed out. Yeah, she's golfing. You pointed out that she's wearing a baseball cap with number 45 on it. Yeah, in the year 2016. I um, uh, When I saw this picture appear on the bottom of our notes, I thought, oh, Russell's going to tell me how she's now kind of a completely swivel-eyed, pack attending maggot eye. <laughs> but apparently it might just be coincidence. Could be coincidence. <laughs> but she might have just yeah. left, found it left over in not in one of the ski chalets and just put it on. Might have had yes, a maggot person true. skiing. Did she strike you as a maggot type? No, not at all. That was why I was quite surprised. <laughs> But the, but the one the one thing that I do notice about the point a she's wearing a great I like a jumpsuit she's wearing she's wearing a great jumpsuit in this segment yeah in tomorrow's yeah, world in tomorrow's yeah. world and b once you've noticed it you can't notice it she blinks so much in this segment I've never seen anybody blink more times while presenting a television thing in my life I did not notice it until you wrote it out at which point when I rewatched the clip I was absolutely gobsmacked <laughs> I did not notice it it, it honestly. If I didn't know better, I'd say she was a hostage <laughs> pleading for assistance. Yeah, now, you promised you were going to count the blinks. Yeah, 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 of course I did. I, I, unfortunately, I don't, know Morse, I don't know Morse code, so I was unable to see whether no, it meant anything. No. But I did indeed count the yeah. blinks. So in that segment, she blinks 83 times, which, which doesn't sound like a huge amount, Mark, but she's mm. not on camera all the time. So I mm. then got a stopwatch and times how long she is actually on mm -hmm. camera for in that segment and she Brilliant. in that segment yep. she is on camera for one minute and 15 seconds which means she has a blink rate 75 seconds she's she has a blink rate of more than one one point one blinks per second <laughs> Brilliant. i don't believe there's anybody who blinks more than that i mean not even our that is incredible yeah, not even blinky the police car are uh our <laughs> early <laughs> Early show. And he was far too Ascot. stoned to blink. Yeah. Remarkable. Oh, we need to do some Blinky the Police Car merch, Russ. <laughs> I wonder why nobody remembers him anymore, Mark. It's so long ago. It was literally years ago. <laughs> anyway. 88 times. So did you say 88? 83, yeah. 80, oh, thank God for that. I was thinking, no, the, the, the number 88 cannot be haunting this program. <laughs> but anyway, she's here. And I'm not sure, I mean, not sure why she's here, really, because I think this is something that Maggie could have done easily. She's here to show off this new, basically, car wash for aeroplanes. It has the same sort of spinny um, brush things that a car wash would have. Yeah. But obviously, the plane doesn't go through it because it would have to be absolutely massive. Uh, <laughs> instead, they bring the car wash to the plane and just sort of have these big sort of these machines with the brushes on poles that sort of go over, go all over the plane. And we're dem and we're shown that with the Strauss Waltz as the mm. vehicles interact, which kind of reminded me of a certain director's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I'm listening. <laughs> music choices <laughs> in certain science fiction films that we're not allowed to mention anymore because it's not on our list. He who should not be named. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's that. I mean, that's kind of it, really, isn't it? It's it's. 
What is the idea? That apparently, like, if you wash a plane, it'll be fuel efficient. Yes. That was it, wasn't it? Well, and also, I, mean, I guess you don't want a grubby plane. I mean, if you, well, no, you don't it, want a grubby plane. It would look bad plane, for your company, but... wouldn't it? If you, yeah. If, you had a, if everyone else has got a shiny plane and you, you're, you're coming into land and it and it's got, like, clean me written in it on in, in somebody's finger. <laughs> you know, or I, yeah. I, wish, I wish my wife was as dirty as this plane. Oh, you know, that, all those classics. Well, that was what was that uh, the 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 figure the little face oh, thing the nose. Kilroy was here. Kilroy was here. Yeah. Yeah. Not that Kilroy. Not Cheryl Shaft Kilroy though. No, no, no. Spelled differently. Vote Veritas. So it looked like a reasonably it looked like a reasonably decent enough idea for cleaning planes. I was thinking, how else do they clean planes? So I I was surprised to discover that they don't use it at all, Mark. Well, it is what I said to you. Is like. I, Somewhat drawn attention earlier by saying it's always oh, it sounds like we're constantly on holiday. But you and I have flown a lot and been on holiday a lot and gone to airports a lot. And I do not ever remember seeing a plane being cleaned at the airport. Mm. De-iced, yeah, definitely, but never cleaned. So what do they do now? Well. Are they just made of, like, dirt-proof material? Because like, the thing is, like, so she's actually on a Dan Air plane which I, I don't know a huge amount about obviously we have a well shout shout out to listener matt birch who's his, his dad absolutely his dad a pilot for dan air yeah actually his name was dan air um but things like that was like it wasn't a low cost it's a bit like logan air wasn't it? it was like it and says it was um a more um approachable airline but following this obviously we have the low cost airline model which basically involves the plane arriving in an airport turfing people out as quickly as possible having the uh the the stewards and stewardess doing a cursory check of the seats to make sure no one soiled themselves and then turfing people on as quickly as possible and flight there is no time to wash the plane so what happens now well the the key is is that is that they take them they obviously have to take them out of service uh, every so often to you know, well give them a service check the engines or whatever yeah. yeah yeah so they do they do it then so the different airlines have different practices regarding how much how often they wash them and how they wash them some do it every two months some do it every six months but they they, they don't do it while it's got any sort of scheduled flights or anything they they wheel it out of service and and then do it and then run checks on it and everything they're all different ways so lufthansa records it takes them between eight and 24 hours to do it whereas united airlines reckon it only takes them five hours to do it a lot of them just clean it like you would clean a car so they just they get high pressure hoses spray it all over and get some get some soapy water and brushes and just just a load of them just stand there on the runway just going give it a scrub giving it a good old scrub and then get the hose out again spray it all over again probably wipe it down so southwest airlines does that i briefly watched a video of them doing it wasn't that interesting as you can imagine <laughs> yeah, um, yeah of course but not. then you've got emirates not a lot of water in the emirates is there mark so they've come up they no. come up with what they call the dry wash they sound like they- <laughs> Which they've just got, they just they just spray it in chemicals, right? They spray it, they've got chemicals they spray it with, the solvents, and it sort of dissolves all of the dirt. And then they've got these mops with cloths on them, and they just wipe the solvent off. Gosh. They don't use any water at all. And they reckon that saves them 11, 11 and a half million litres of water a year. There's no mention of what they do with all of the chemicals and and yeah and the fact that they use. I want to see if they must Which wash they them somewhere yeah. into the sea or something yeah. but, so, uh, something needs <laughs> rinsing yeah. but yeah but they're really proud of the fact of how much water they save with no mention of what they do with the chemicals brilliant well, KLM does a hybrid of the two of, of wet and dry and they save about 8 million litres of water a year yes yeah, so, but there's two there's two reasons why they do it they do it as they say to save for fuel efficiency but they also do it more importantly so that they can see if there's any damage to the plane because they, they're doing expe- inspections when they're doing the service. They need to be able to see, you know, whether there's any surface damage to the fuselage or anything like that. So that's an important thing where they do it. But yeah. then this led me into a little thing about, oh, you know, I wonder how much, you know, a clean plane, how much more fuel efficient a clean plane is to a dirty plane. I, was, I wasn't able to find, Great question. Wasn't able to find that, that out. Oh, okay. But I did, I did find out about paint. <laughs> And this is quite interesting. So do you remember, Eric, until, from, until reasonably recently, American Airlines, their planes were shiny. They weren't, they weren't painted at all. Yeah, they were like, you know, metal. Yes, yeah. yeah, which I always thought was quite a cool look for an airplane. It looked yeah, great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't do it anymore. That, so that was saving them 70 kilos of weight per plane because the amount of paint on a plane weighs 70 kilos, right, on average, Mark. Yeah. So if you scale that up to their fleet and the amount of flights they were doing, that was saving them what just over a million liters of fuel a year in weight saving wow. just by not painting their planes yeah 
But the problem is, is that they they still had to polish their planes. So the wax. So they so they're still po- <laughs> yeah. polishing. You had to polish the plane three times a year, and each time it would cost them ninety two thousand dollars. So in the end, yeah. the cost of polishing the planes superseded the cost of the fuel that they were saving. Wow, so that's why American yeah. Airlines are no longer that nice shiny colour and they're mm. boring grey like all the rules. Yeah. But then that did lead me to another amazing fact, and that <clears> is <throat> is that if Concorde, right? Mm-hmm. The colour of the con- colour of Concorde changed how fast it was able to go. So the Concorde was predominantly white. Mm-hmm. But then in the nineties, the Concorde got sponsored by one of them got sponsored by Pepsi. So they pa- so they painted yeah. they painted the whole thing blue. Yeah, that plane wasn't allowed to go. So Concorde was meant to cruise at Mach two. That Concorde, the the Pepsi Concorde, was only allowed to cruise at Mach two for twenty minutes at a time because it was painted blue, and blue absorbs uh, ra- radiates more heat when it gets when it gets hot than white, and so it was causing like it, co- it caused t- turbulence for the plane. So it wasn't allowed to go fast for as long. Incredible. So if you if you extend that. It, that means that if Virgin Atlantic had flown the Concorde instead of British Airways, because the because the Virgin Atlantic doesn't have any blue on its on its livery, the Virgin Atlantic Concorde would be able to go slightly faster than a British Airways Concorde because British Airways has got some blue on its livery by a, like a fraction of a second. It would be faster. That's incredible. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, that actually is. I had no idea. Hope it was worth a BA. <laughs> Should have focused on your tyres. Really. <laughs> yeah. I'd, l- I'd love to have flown Concorde. Oh, same here. Yeah, definitely. Probably got to chat to David Frost, couldn't you? Because he was always on there when he was on the. He used to fly on it. Absolutely. Constantly. I think he lived on it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Live workspace. Hello. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, yeah. So the yeah, this this rotary washing thing doesn't exist, Mark. As far as I could find, anyway. I mean, maybe it went the way of Dan Air. Yes, quite. Or maybe they just do it in a shed and not on the tarmac of a Swedish airport. This week, doctors from Cambridge and Bristol have recommended in a letter to The Lancet that certain types of freely available baby food should not be fed to babies under four weeks old, except on doctor's advice. The foods in question are soy-based milk substitutes, often given to babies who can't digest cow's milk. As we reported in 1986, these products can contain high levels of aluminium, which may be dangerous to both premature babies and those with kidney problems. The doctors now say that research has shown that all babies in the first four weeks of life are more likely to absorb aluminium because their digestive systems are immature. They advise that soy-based milk substitutes shouldn't be given to these very young babies unless there's a good reason. The doctors also want information on the aluminium content of milk products and the local water used to make up the food made available to medical staff caring for babies at risk. However, the doctors do stress that there's currently no evidence that soy-based milks given to babies older than four weeks are likely to cause any health problems. Now, Mark, I was allergic to milk when I was a baby, uh, something that my parents didn't initially realise. Um, wondered why I was crying so much, I think, but then it transpired because I was in pain because I was allergic to milk. Then this made me realise, does that mean that I am actually a soy boy, as the, as the internet <laughs> It's the term is, is yeah so, yeah. Do, do you think I, I'm, I'm a, a stereotypical soy boy? Yeah, Mark? you are hashtag a classic beta cocker. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I looked into this. Why why soy boys are called soy boys? It's because soy products contain a large amount of estrogen. Yeah. yeah. So that, and they yeah, they exactly, think that if you exactly correct, consume yeah. it, it will turn you into a woman. Um, Obviously, there's no... Yeah, there's, the, the really is, Russ. <laughs> there's no clinical evidence for this, Mark. Yeah. But yeah, and so, and it also turns out that I, I was, uh, c- must have consuming, you know, like tin cans worth of aluminium. Who knew? This, this baby form is absolutely, you know, basically clanking in, in, in the jar. Lots yeah. Lots of quantities of aluminium in it. No wonder you can pick babies up with magnets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I must stop trying. Was was the was the eighties the golden age of food scares? 
late eighties, early nineties, late early nineties. You say well, I, a food <laughs> scary of the week. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, I'd say late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, definitely. Or, or that kind of universal food scare because I, I think in general uh, people's diets have broadened out much more as, as both individuals but also as a population. I think people eat different things from each other in a way that they just <laughs> back then everyone was drinking milk and eating eggs every <laughs> single day. That was it. You'd have a Mars bar as a treat if you were lucky. And having a, a, a cow spine in a bat. Is that, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, cow spine in a bat. That's a good, yeah, well, you need a baguette, though, really, if you're going to have a proper spine. But yeah. So, yeah, obviously, I, I checked this out. This, this is um largely overblown problem. Food Standards Agency report from 2013, I looked in, they looked into this. We actually consume quite a lot of aluminium, Mark, because... <clears throat> mm-hmm. When they purify water, water for purification plants, they chuck aluminium sulfate in the water, and what it, and it acts as a it, it's what gets all the crap out of the water because it causes all of the dirt and everything to coagulate around the aluminium sulfate, and then mm-hmm. it either sinks to the bottom of the settle tank or it gets caught in filters. So all of our drinking mm-hmm. water contains various amounts of aluminium. Obviously, dirtier mm, water's got more it. of it in it, and cleaner water's got less of it in it. Mm. So that means we're all consuming aluminium all the time. So everyone has a base amount of aluminium in it. Um, yeah. And so the Food Standards Agency looked at this, and then they looked at the amount of aluminium in uh, soy. And I discovered that soy and soya are the same thing. I wonder whether there's a difference, but no, soy and soya are the same thing. So they need to agree on, you know, what they're going to call it, don't they, really? What would you say, soy or soya? Soy. soy. Right. Yeah. Saving those A's for something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pouring them in pain. <laughs> so soy formula does contain much more aluminium than cow milk formula it's like double the amount but they then worked out they, they worked out the worst possible circumstances where you live in an area where your water's got loads of aluminium in it and then you use the soy formula and you make it together with that and you have a, a newborn baby that's got a really high absorption rate and all of this and they worked out that it's still spongy baby spongy baby yeah he would still yeah. only absorb a third of the amount of uh, aluminium that would be considered even anything to worry about. So it's basically... It's a nonsense. It's nothing to worry about at all, yeah. 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 Okay. So anybody out there with any newborn babies, feel free to feed them as much aluminium as you like. They're absolutely fine. So uh, Lord Gummer will be on the TV tomorrow feeding his uh, granddaughter lashings <laughs> yeah. of uh, soy milk. No cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Following the government-sponsored conference on the ozone layer, it's become clear that scientists have now identified alternatives to all the harmful chlorofluorocarbons. CFCs are very stable molecules based on one or two carbon atoms to which are attached chlorine and fluorine atoms. But that stability also means that if they escape, the CFCs have plenty of time to diffuse the 20 kilometres or so up to the stratosphere where the ozone layer is found. But alternatives to CFCs can be made by replacing some of the chlorine and fluorine atoms with hydrogen. This makes the molecules much more chemically reactive so that they'll break down in the lower atmosphere and never reach the ozone layer. Although testing continues to make sure that these new alternatives are sufficiently safe, it is clear that the main obstacle to a complete ban on CFCs is the enormous cost of changing whole industries to cope with the new compounds. Enormous cost, Mark. A, a, a environmental problem that cost loads of money. Uh, but they did it, didn't they? We did it. <laughs> we did it, Russ. <laughs> Isn't it amazing to, 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 to look at something like that and uh, go, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, people, everyone puts their mind to it. You do it, can't you? Problem solved. Problem solved, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. It is incredible. I mean, like, I don't, I don't think it's... <laughs> I don't think it's remarked upon enough. And I, I, I do appreciate people younger than us, which obviously is known in our audience, not really fully appreciating that the ozone layer was the climate crisis of, of our childhood. Yeah. And it was a clear and present existential threat. Oh, was it existential? I suppose probably not really. Not because it was, you know, because we were digging into the earth. But like, you know, it, it was literally, <laughs> the, the, the way it was... Not literally, but the, the way it was kind of sold was almost like there was a hole in the ozone layer, and if it got big enough, frankly, it, it's no different to living in... Uh, you're basically going to be shot by laser beams <laughs> every single <laughs> minute of every single yeah. day, all right? So, you know, we're going to we're gonna have to close that hole. And we did it. You know, we, we, you know, CFCs were everywhere. They were in hairspray, they were in fridges, and now they're not, and... We're all the better for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I will be honest. Some might describe me as cynical. I would say I'm realistic. I am 
professionally paid to be cynical. I, part of my job has been to sit and think of how things can go wrong. And I'm, I'm quite good at it. But as a result, I'm always quite optimistic because my feeling is if you can think of the worst thing that's going to happen, you can do something about it. And I still maintain, I genuinely believe it's not that climate change will be reversed. But at some point, there will be a pivot where it, it basically you can make money from solving climate change and a, a, enough people will go like oh actually we you know th- there is it's not like oh we can make money so it's like profits more like we're not going to lose money by doing this so we might as well do this and and things will get slightly better but we'll see but th- that's just based on like experience and and things like the ozone layer which which honestly was going to kill us mm. all am i wrong I, I don't feel like i'm i'm exaggerating that much that and eggs were going to kill us all in the late 80s, early 90s. And and now, obviously, you know, the ozone layer has never been never been do you, thicker. Do you, do you think the uh, early 90s uh, Jamie Theakston presented TV programme, The Ozone? The Ozone, would have been yeah, called that w- with Jane Middlemiss. Would have been called that without CFCs being invented? Or do you think, do you think CFCs oh, are entirely responsible gosh. for the naming of that programme? I, I 100% agree with you, Ross. Yes, I never thought that. I, I'm intrigued by the fact that your instant... Ozone presenter go to is 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 Theakston, not Middlemas. I've got more issue with that than your theory. <laughs> I mean, neither of them are our screens anymore, are they? Is Theakston not like a kind of a heart FM DJ? Oh, is he? Like what, what about Middlemas? What's she up to? I don't know. Sadly, no, I, don't, I, I don't tell you. I saw Middlemas once in real life. Go in, on, at Las Vegas. She was in a no way. She was in a wedding dress in a casino. So I assume she just got married. Oh, but she was just larking about. Not she us. was larking about with some, with, with like running around some fruit machines in a wedding dress. Yeah. Oh, how exciting! Small world. Yeah. Anyway, I've got nothing back to say about CFCs because I've covered them in a. Was Theakston there? No, no, I didn't see him. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, that's it. Uh, uh, no, we can move on. Old peculiar. A new so-called smokeless cigarette has been withdrawn from sale in America. Last November, we reported on the new cigarette shown on the right here. It avoided producing carcinogenic smoke by the simple expedient of not burning any tobacco. Instead, hot air produced by a smouldering carbon tip was drawn by the smoker through a capsule of granules coated with tobacco extract and glycerol. The resulting glycerol mist delivered nicotine but not tar to the lungs. Although American health groups campaign vigorously against the new cigarette, in fact it was consumer dissatisfaction that made the makers, R.J. Reynolds, withdraw it. Smokers are reported to have complained that it tasted disgusting and that you almost needed a blowtorch to light the end. This failure is a major blow to the American tobacco industry. The company has spent several hundred million dollars producing the new cigarette, which was meant to stop the rapid decline in American cigarette sales. Mmm, delicious fag, smart. Mmm. <laughs> mm. Imagine. Yeah. What's that from? Uh, is it Father Ted where they were trying to. Father Ted, as Father Ted, the smoke up. comes yeah. out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just think. <laughs> imagine how disgusting that cigarette must have to taste for smoke to smokers to complain about how, how bad it tastes. Are cigarettes the product with the best PR ever? <laughs> because yeah. they literally provide nothing but negative things and i appreciate at some point people thought that was not yeah. necessary, or they didn't think that was they didn't know that was the case but when you and i <clears throat> neither of us are smokers when you and i uh were at school the barrier to entry for smoking on paper was so high <laughs> that no one should ever do it and yet quite a lot of our friends yeah. smoked because it was cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like isn't that incredible when you think about it? It is, yeah, yeah. I mean, did you have, did you, have you ever had a cigarette? You must have, you never. must have been given one, had a drag. No, no, never, see, I did. Never tried one, and, one and it was, it was absolutely as rotten as I always assumed it would be. <laughs> and I, I had such great pleasure in going like, well, that's it. I, I, you know, I never really thought it was cool, and now I know for a fact it's rotten to the core. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, yeah. I'm not going to smoke. Brilliant! What a relief. And that, <laughs> just, Mark, I'm afraid, so is why you've never. Oh. That's why you've never been called, cool, Mark. I'm afraid. That's the thing. <laughs> I can't believe you're saying that the co-presenter of Tomorrow's World all the time has never been cool. Wash your mouth out. R.J. Reynolds, Mark, based mm-hmm. in my favourite U.S. states of North Carolina, 
Um, mm. Obviously, big tobacco. You do like North big, Carolina. Big tobacco area. That what what I thought was interesting. They they were they were set up and for many years operated out of Winston Salem, uh, which is why obviously they mm-hmm. sell cigarettes called Winston's. Mm-hmm. Oh, but I then, didn't know that. Okay, is that where the name? Then came from? in recent years, they've they moved to a new location in North Carolina. And do you know what that, that what that place is called? Well, it's, it's, it's actually a village. It's quite unusual in America. Most places aren't called villages; they're called town, towns. Oh, no. or Every, yeah, everyone's yeah, called yeah. it. Four people yeah, can yeah. agree they're a town or a city. Yeah. Uh, no, I've no idea. I wouldn't even know. Which Tobaccoville. <laughs> <laughs> oh stop! I literally was about to say Tobacco Town, USA. Go on, yeah, All right. yeah, yeah, Tobaccoville, USA. It's good, okay. isn't it? Yeah, this is this is actually yeah. I, uh, actually quite an interesting story. This so at the, in the eighties, the CEO of RJ Reynolds was a man called Ty Lee Wilson, and he decided to embark upon this project for this cigarette, which which ended up being called the Premier. Without telling the board of the company, he did it in secret. So none of the board of directors heard about this. And the only the only reason they found out was one day one of the one of the board members was being driven onto the site, and he saw there was a brand new building in like in the complex. Mm-hmm. And he said to his driver, "What's oh, that new building over there?" And the driver said, "Oh yeah, that's where they're working on the new smokeless cigarette." And this is like, and this was like five years after they started working on it. And the CEO had been it's, it's like his pet project. He invested millions and millions of dollars in it. He never told. He never anyone. told it. He never told it. Like all, all the like scientists and that working on it all knew about it, but none of the people that should have been signing off on it knew about it at all. People paying. Yeah, for yeah, it. paying for it. And, it, and, and yeah. in the end, the, the whole project cost between eight hundred million and a billion dollars to develop. Jesus, in the eighties. Yeah, 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 yeah. At the end of the eighties. That's real money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's launched it. He's oh. launched in nineteen eighty eight, and so it has. So it's like new Coke. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it has similarities to a vape in that it, you're not smoking burning tobacco, but it's not the same as a vape. Yeah. It's what's technically known as a heated tobacco product. So you're heating the tobacco and the vapors are coming off. So in the case of this, it has little aluminium pellets. So it's, it's kind of more like a bomb kind of thing then, is it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know is how that, bombs that a, work, to be honest. I don't know. Yeah. Why, isn't, are you heating something? I don't know, anyway. <laughs> Once again, the alum, more aluminium. It's got aluminium pellets in it that contain small amounts of tobacco, and then it's got the gly- glycerol in it. So you could inhale all of the. So you'd you would, you would heat the tobacco by lighting the car- charcoal tip. So that bit you were actually lighting. That's providing the heat, mm. providing the heat. Mm. But you weren't breathing in any of the smoke of that. That was just heating up the contents, and then you were breathing in straight, basically just straight nicotine as much as you could. So it meant you didn't. You had hardly any smoke, and you had you weren't breathing in any tar. So what it was genuinely a healthier cigarette. So it was it was doing what it set out to do. Mm. Um, the problem was was when they tested it on smokers, uh, less than five percent enjoyed the taste of it. Uh, they didn't like the taste of the charcoal. They tested it in Japan because Japan's that, Japanese actually love a cigarette, don't they? Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> researchers were explicitly told this tastes like shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. God, they're quite diplomatic people. <laughs> When that previous chief executive got kicked off for when they found out about his him developing this thing, they, they booted him out. So they got a new chief executive called F. Ross Johnson. And when, <laughs> when he tried it, the combination of the, the sulfur tip of the match that he used to light it and the charcoal created like a, a sulfurous odour that the chief executive said <laughs> tasted like smoking a fart. So <laughs> Wow. And and yeah, and, and the company estimated that to acquire a taste for these premier cigarettes, to acquire to a taste, acquire a taste yeah. they reckoned that a, a, a person would have to smoke between two to three packs of them before they killed their taste buds <laughs> enough to accept the taste of these new <sighs> premier cigarettes. And they were, they were oh Jesus! And, and and people who smoke famously have incredibly appalling taste buds. <laughs> yeah. So, but they they were thinking, oh yeah, this will definitely happen. But what actually happened is that obviously they these people tried one, went, my God, this is awful, and then just gave away yeah. the rest to their mates and just carried on smoking normal cigarettes. So the thing was a complete disaster. So a year later, they just yeah, they yeah. just binned it. Binned it. They tried to come back in 1994. They came back with another one called the Eclipse, which they somehow managed to make somehow managed to improve the flavour of that one. Worked slightly differently, but on a similar principle. It had more tobacco in it, I think. And that one lasted until 2015. Uh, they were still doing that until then. And it was the only cigarette that was allowed to be smoked inside RJ Reynolds' offices because of the small amount of... It didn't produce enough smoke for it to be against their smoking policy in their, inside Gosh, their offices. Isn't that amazing? But obviously these days... Jesus, okay. But obviously these days you don't, you don't have ones that you like because what's taken over the market? You've got, you've got, you've got two rival products now. You've got vapes. 
which don't have any tobacco in them at all. They're just they're just full mm-hmm. of the glycerol juice, basically, and <coughs> watermelon yeah. flavour and nicotine. But then you still you've still got you still got like these heated tobacco products, which do contain tobacco, which isn't lit. But they run on the same principles of vape in that they've got a battery and they use electricity. So Philip Morris have called on the market in that, and they have a thing called the IQOS. But it looks just like a vape, but it's just working on a different principle because it's actually got tobacco in it. So do you take a chance? Oh, lo- lucky smokers. I mean, <laughs> if, I, if I were going to smoke, Mark, yeah. and I have no... Pl- pipe, I have no pl- Yeah, I was going to say, pi- it's got to be pipe. It's got to be pipe. Yeah. I, 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 Russ, without, I didn't even yeah, need you to tell me what you're going to... Of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely. I don't, I mean, I don't I, understand. <laughs> I also, I don't understand. Why is there not vape pipes? Because a, a pipe is a... No. It's bulky enough to contain the Ugh. battery and the heating element and everything like that. Yeah. Why is there not? And it's a much better looking thing. Because one of the things I think about vape, vapes look silly, don't they? They, 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 they look they stupid. Look juvenile. Infantile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why can yeah. you not put the gubbins the inside pipe, a pipe? As a non-smoker, I feel jealous that I can never, even when I am in my moments of deepest thought, I will never look as thoughtful as a man with a pipe. <laughs> yeah. He looks off into the distance to consider anything. Yeah. He might be thinking about the latest plot line in EastEnders. It doesn't matter. As far as I'm concerning, he's thinking about the troubles of the world today. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd love a pipe. I really would, and, actually. And, I just think it would suit me. gesturing. Using it to gesture at things. Mm. Well. Yeah, just... Gesture in mm, the general yeah, direction just, or just something. Jabbing with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the bit that goes in your mouth and kind of, hmm, yes. <laughs> Young man. Young man, yes. Oh, oh. Pipe smokers are the best ones. <laughs> they still do pipe smoke of the year? <laughs> I don't know. Probably, yeah. I hope it's not. It gets less press than it used to. On the way of rear of the year, I hope. I wonder, do you reckon anybody has managed to win pipe smoke of the year and rear of the year? Is it like, like the, the <laughs> egot sort of like of there? Uh, oh my god! Do you think? Do you think Carol Vorderman ever thought about smoking a pipe just <laughs> yeah, to win? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, mm. next. News this week that humpback whales may be the poets of the animal kingdom. American researchers who studied over 500 of the humpback songs found clear evidence that they rhyme. To the human ear, the rhymes are hard to detect, but the researchers say that to a whale, this ending of a phrase... ..is a perfect rhyme with this one. No one is quite sure why whales sing at all, but the songs of all the whales in a given area will be the same. The researchers found that the longer the song, and they can be up to half an hour long, the greater the number of rhymes. And so they suggest that rhyming helps the whales, just as it does humans, to remember. Whale meet again, Mark. Don't know where, (laughs) don't know when. Oh, cubic reference, well done. Oh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Humpback whales... Can't mention his name. (laughs) The stars of uh, Star Trek IV, of course. I was, reminis- course, I was reminiscing so about... I was just thinking, is it, is it... It could be one of the greatest scenes in all of cinema. It's right near the end of Star Trek IV, where you see the whaling ship, and you think it's about to, about to spear, harpoon the whales. And then the Klingon bird of prey decloaks in front of the whaling ship, mm. and you punch the air in celebration. Love that scene, Mark. Can't get enough of it. It really, it really made me uh, appreciate whales. <laughs> Um, you know what else made me appreciate whales? I know. Do tell. Is that during my? I managed to find a couple of completely unrelated whale facts while briefly looking into this segment, and they're quite astonishing. Actually, they're probably the best facts of the episode. A margarine for the mo- for the first half of the twentieth century, most margarine was made out of whale oil. Did you know that? Did, nope. They continue. It was. It was only in the 1960s that they stopped putting whale oil in margarine. Wow! I thought margarine was actually the cheap version of butter. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was invented as a cheap version of butter. <laughs> so, in the, in when it was first invented, it was invented in 1869 by a French lady, who then sold the patent to a Dutch company, which it ended up. Conv- I assume her name is Marjorie. Uh, uh, no, oh no, I don't think it was. I think Ooh. I think the word margarine means something in French. It was meant to be like a cheap butter substitute, but it, at the time when she invented it, she used beef fat. And then, as as the, as the years went on, people stopped using uh, whale because whale oil used to be used for everything. It used to be used for like mm. lamps and all sorts. Then obviously electric light came in and gas light, all things like that. So the value of whale oil started to go down. This didn't stop people from killing whales. 
So there was like a, a glut of whale oil, basically. So they started turning it into margarine. Uh, and so everyone was just eating whale oil margarine mm. for, for decades. And at one point, so it got to the point in, in the Second World War, you know, there's that, there's, that, there's, that, there's, there's sometimes stories about Hitler trying to set up a uh, secret base on Antarctica. Have you ever heard that story? Yes. He had, like, yes, he had a secret yes, expedition yes. to Antarctica. Guy didn't have a secret expedition to Antarctica to try and set up a secret base. He went there to look for whales so, he could, so that they could make some more margarine for Nazi Germany. That's why they went to Antarctica. Gosh. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yes, it is, yeah. It's fucking nuts. <laughs> it does make me wonder. It makes me, you know, it makes me wonder. I wonder what, apparently, it was, I, um, it was initially quite fishy tasting, but they found a, they found a way yes. of, they found a way of removing the fishy qualities to it. There is a guy on YouTube who is doing an incredibly involved, incredibly long series of YouTube videos where he is tracking the life of and for some people this is this is a reference they may not get for some people it might be a reference that they might remember from about 15 years ago a guy called chris chan christopher chandler who is one of the first kind of internet lol cows and it's hugely impressive because I, I'm, I'm not going to go into details about that specific thing however very recently he dropped a youtube video that's about five and a half hours long and it is about scott's expeditions to the north pole no south pole rather and the incredibly well done, incredibly well researched. And as I watched it, and I didn't watch it in one go, I watched it over several nights, I don't think I appreciated <laughs> how much of Arctic and Antarctic exploration was entirely whale-based. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not yeah. lying. Like, like the, the reason it came into my mind was like, they ate whales, they wore whales, the dogs ate whales, the donkeys ate whales. Amundsen, Scott, neither of them got to the North Pole first. A whale got to the North Pole first. It's actually astonishing. And in a weird way, it's like, it's incredible how eager we were all, we were, we as a species were to find out exactly how much <laughs> whale stuff could fuel our exploration of the world. There, there, was, there wasn't a problem that we wouldn't try whale stuff to see if it would work. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you don't even think it. You don't think about it at all. But no. it's been, cause it's been sort of, yeah, there, there was loads of them. I mean, one of the other ones was that the reason the Japanese got really back into whaling after the Second World War was that General MacArthur retooled all their whaling boats because he was worried about the Japanese starving after they'd been after they surrendered. Mm. So MacArthur just went, oh, well, get whaling. You could be able to feed yourselves loads. And that's why the Japanese are and, still and God knows, into they're, whaling. They're, they're an enthusiastic people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. But um, the other interesting whale fact I found, vinyl records, they have like pressings, mm -hmm. don't they? They have like... They have a, yes. Do you know the, the single largest ever pressing of a record was in 1979, and it was the Songs of the Humpback Whale, which they pressed <laughs> 10 million copies of to be included in copies of National Geographic magazine in 1979. Generally. No, I did not know yeah. that. <laughs> and that's, that that's, that's more pressing than any other record ever pressed. And I was astonished. I didn't realise National Geographic had such a high circulation. It did, yeah. No, it's incredible. It, to, it, it yeah. reached a circulation of like 12 million at one point. It's amazing. Jesus Christ, yeah. But yeah, so but yeah. everyone heard, obviously well, there was millions of people heard this whale song on this record. And it's one of the things that sort of like helped really boost the let's stop whaling movement. Yeah, so that, that's, why, that's why it got banned. In the eighties, but anyway, yeah. So this whale song, Mark. If you notice the, the obviously Maggie's talking about how they they reckon they've discovered that whale song. They say rhymes. I don't know whether it's quite the quite the right way of saying. It. I don't. Is that the right way of saying? It? Maybe it is. Um, well, it's what they say. Yeah. Uh, yeah wh whether it's accurate, but I, you get the sentiment. Yeah. Like, like, um, but but I yeah. did. I did find. I think it's the same study or or a similar study or by the same people at least. And at the bottom there, mm. what they've done mm. there is that. They took whale song and they noticed that whale song contains a certain number of almost like notes and mm. and they create a certain pattern on sonar. So what they did is they then turned those patterns on the sonar into a musical notation, which is what you can see there. Mm -hmm. And then when they mm. and then they recorded whale song and converted it into this new musical notation. And then they were able to see, oh yeah, it does. It looks like music. It kind of, and you could see the mm. repetition and the patterns mm. and everything Absolutely. like that. And it's actually quite, it's much prettier than normal musical notation, isn't it? Nice colours and shapes and stuff. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> Go on then, Russ, sing it. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Shut up, Chewie. <laughs>
But the thing is, like, because it is impressive. I, I, I mean, I saw it initially because I only saw the first one. It's like, I don't know what's going on. And then you show, you, you have the second one where it is, like, notes. And you go, like, oh, I get it. The thing is, they're, they're not singing, are they? It, it's They're communicating. Yes. So, uh, uh, colour me uh, impressed when you turn around and can communicate with a whale on their own terms because you understand what they're talking about. I mean, this isn't, they're not singing Toxic by Britney Spears here. <laughs> you know, they're actually, you know, like they're conveying messages. And the fact that we think it rhymes means that there, there's an element of artistry to what they're saying. Like, it's probably quite a sophisticated language. It's like, tell me what they're saying, uh, or, or in, more importantly, you know, uh, convey a message to them, and then, and then I'll be impressed. They did, I, one thing the studies did say that is that they reckon that the, one, the <clears throat> messages that rhyme are the ones that the whales think are more important and need to be remembered. And I wasn't sure mm. how they if, they... if they can't understand what the message is... If I told you once, I told you <laughs> if twice. They can't un- <laughs> if they can't understand what the whale's saying, how do they know which ones are important? Or not? Yeah, they don't, Russ. They're making it up. <laughs> do you think? Maybe they do, don't they? Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, I, 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 I think the idea that, like, if whales are repeating something, that they're probably saying something impressive, uh, important is probably true. But it's only probably true. It's not true. <laughs> Don't touch the Marjorie. Maybe it's that. Oh, soil and green is made of whales. <laughs> I think that's it, Mark. Yeah, we've already said too much, Russ. Let's move on. Hold tight, Dave. You may not believe it, but I actually do this kind of thing quite often. In fact, I've spent so much time working with this machine that now we're really beginning to communicate. This is the world's first talking vacuum cleaner. Now, that may not be top of everyone's shopping list, but it can monitor quite a range of problems. I think there's one happening now. Is clogged. Clear the blockage. Ah, clear the blockage. Well, I know it's blocked because I blocked it, just to show you that it did speak. And... is clogged. Clear the blockage. I've done it now. Thank you very much. Inside here, pressure sensors monitor airflow through the hose and the bag, and if there's a blockage or the bag's full, the air pressure changes, and they complete a circuit to the microprocessor, which triggers the voice synthesizer. A temperature sensor picks up any overheating, and a contact switch here will monitor whether the bag is fitted correctly. So if I unfit it correctly, let's see whether it tells me about it. It has to think. Is not correctly fitted. Ah, well, this cleaner will be in the shops later this year, and it could be just the start of a whole range of domestic tools. Bag which is we'll, not correctly we'll be able to fitted. talk to you whilst you're doing the housework, but don't worry, <coughs> it won't nag you when you switch it off. In the meantime, here's Peter. Now, this segment comes at a very timely moment, Mark. It's quite quite opposite for my real life because, as I was telling you before we started recording this. I've been doing a lot of DIY recently, renovating mm. my new house, and I had to do a lot of a lot of sanding, like a lot, a lot of sanding, where, where I was creating like piles and piles and piles of dust. And I tried vacuuming it up with my um, Amazon's Basics vacuum cleaner, uh, and after a couple of days of this, the motor got higher and higher and higher pitched. Until uh, suddenly there was a, a nasty burning noise, a burning smell, and uh, it, it stopped sucking the dust up altogether. It, it, I'd, complete, I'd completely killed the vacuum cleaner. Um, I think it's the first, first and only time I've ever killed a vacuum cleaner. Mark, I felt quite, you know, proud. Oh, no, I felt, you know, I felt a bit bad. A bit bad. <laughs> I don't know. Would I have felt wor- if mm. I would I have felt worse though if the vacuum cleaner were going like with a voice, been going, "Please, I'm choking. Please stop. Full of dust." All right, well. I've told you before, uh, and I've told this podcast before, uh, we, we have a robot vacuum cleaner who we call uh, Howl 4500, and we'll send him round, and uh, every now and then he'll get stuck because they get stuck, and he sends us a message saying, please help, I'm stuck. <laughs> and it's it's soul-destroying, Russ. It's it's, it's heartbreaking. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, it would be worse, Russ, if if, if you're... Oh, if our, if our vacuum cleaners would... Could only communicate with us. We wouldn't use them. No, but yeah, no. I got, I got, I got to replace them, Mark. But this time, I got a, I got a Karcher industrial vacuum cleaner. Oh wow! <laughs> From 0 to sixty. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a beast. 
You could you could you could even use it to clear floods. It's got, it's got water sucking <laughs> power and everything. That also doesn't. Talk. I mean, it's German, so even if, if it yeah. did talk, it would presumably talk to me <laughs> in a stereotypical German manner. Yeah, 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 yeah 100%, <laughs> yes, yes. Let's not go too yeah. far, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of which, this the voice that they use for this this talking Hoover, and it is a Hoover. Yeah. We're not just using that in the generic sense of the word. It is literally a Hoover that. Howard's got here. It's an interesting choice of voice, isn't it? The hectoring school mom. <laughs> yeah. Well, it definitely cuts through the noise, doesn't it? Like it, it's, um, yeah, it, it makes sense because I suppose at the time a lot of automated voices like that would have been warning sounds, you know, yeah. doors closing, mind the gap, whatever. Excuse me. So it, it would make sense that that would be what you would build from. But I suppose what technology has realised is that actually a soft, soothing voice. Fine words do butter past <laughs> We should, should, we, should we explain why we're watching this episode? I think we. I think we've already explained, haven't we? <laughs> oh, I know, but 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 why? Why did Dave? Why was why why would someone write into us and at, plead to see this episode? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, Dave. Dave had been listening to a rival podcast, and it was about exactly. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Shame him. Yeah, and it was about um, the Hoover free flights scandal. Scandal. Yeah. Yes. Which I'm sure that that podcast covers much better than I possibly would, especially as I've not researched it. But what was it, Hoover? Was well, I remember it? You remember it? <clears throat> it was Hoover. <clears throat> I remember because it, it was a huge deal at the time. Yeah, it was a huge deal, and I remember it got picked up by Watchdog, and it felt like it was on. It was on Watchdog every bloody was Watchdog on a Wednesday, whatever. It was on every week. I don't remember the amount, but basically, if you bought a certain price of Hoover products. Hundred pounds, two hundred pounds. They were offering you free flight, free return flights to the US. My memory is that they had done a promo one or two years before where they were offering free flights to Europe, and that had worked well. But they were eager to boost their income, and so they wafted US flights. Which you know, to be honest, I like I would have been hundreds of quid worth of you know it, it would have cost hundreds and hundreds, of hundreds of pounds to fly to America back then. Especially on Concorde. Um, I mean, m- much like now, especially, hmm? on Concord. Well, it's, especially on Concorde. I mean, it's the only way to fly for us, as we all know. But my memory is that Hoover basically a underestimated demand, whereas a lot of people thought like, well, if I buy a hundred pound Hoover, I'm going to get five hundred quid's worth of flights mm. and a free Hoover. So why the <laughs> hell wouldn't I do it? So they underestimate demand, but they also tried to create a system that made it very difficult to claim the flights. And my memory is that not only were were they try was it like a bit of a fake sales pitch because they really made it difficult to claim the flights. Like you had to kind of you had to initially apply within a couple of weeks, and then when they sent you a form, you had to send it back within a couple of weeks. And if you missed it by a day, you were out. And it wasn't that you said, like, oh, I'd like to fly from Heathrow to New York. It's more like, uh, here are some places I, I will happily fly from, and here's when I would fly from. And Hoover could say, like, nah, nah, we don't want to give you those. Here, instead of flying from Heathrow to New York in April, we're going to offer you flights from Edinburgh to uh, Erie, Indiana in October. Do you want those? Oh, you don't. Okay, you cancel them. But then the other thing is, I, I think they made a deal with some weird airline that went under quite quickly soon after. Oh. So they, they basically realized they were on the hook for millions of pounds worth of flight tickets. And yes, they'd sold a lot of Hoovers, but the Hoover, people were only buying the £100 Hoovers and they were having to give them flights worth 600 quid or whatever, 500 quid. And they cancelled it. But the problem was, <clears throat> so many people had, had successfully navigated their incredibly labyrinthine system that they actually owed them all this yeah. money. And I th- I I feel like people were still suing them like 10 years later. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it was a scandal like in, in every sense. It's like there's a reason, you know, we in Britain still talk about hoovering because it was what people bought. People bought hoovers. Mm. Even in America, where hoovers from, they don't call it hoovering because they had lots. But everyone, you know, like I swear, I imagine 50% I mean, of cro- vacuum cleaners were hoovers. Cross-dressing would be more likely to be called hoovering in America, wouldn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Very good, yeah. Or or or, or damming yeah, up a river. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I imagine if you put in hoover scandal, you're probably going to come up with some, you know, with cross-dressing or... <laughs> Or something to do with kind of a misallocation of funds for uh, dams and, and and things like it, it was one of those. It's one of those scandals when I was growing up that felt 
like even as a child seeing it unfold is like well hang on a minute that's wrong they never had any desire to fulfill it in the first place that that that's my memory but i i, I remember quite well because it just felt like it dominated pop culture for like months and months and months because people were offered something it's like no one who applied for those tickets they weren't doing anything wrong. They weren't trying to take advantage of anything. They, they hadn't found a loophole. Hoover screwed them over. Yeah. Imagine, imagine if they, like, on, on Watchdog, that like Linfold Woods had just gone. And uh, we actually have a representative from Hoover uh, in the studio to uh, explain, <laughs> explain this. And it just pans over and it's just one of these vacuum yeah. cleaners. There's a blockage <laughs> in that pipe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Dave, obviously, write in and if I've got it wrong. I've not listened to that. I can't believe you listened to other podcasts. That raises, isn't it? I don't, I don't, I don't do, think that's the... Are we not long I, enough? I do we need to go it, twice as long? <laughs> do you have free time? <laughs> but I, honestly, I would not buy this. I, I The idea of getting a Hoover, uh, getting a vacuum cleaner that chided you for... Well, you, you would, and, you would and, dread, and, you would as, dread as the you... chimes, wouldn't you? That's the thing. You would dread the chimes. Yeah, you would. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what have I done wrong? <laughs> Uh, and as you said, it's like they're not telling you anything you shouldn't know there's a problem with. Mm. You know there's a blockage of the pipe because it's not picking up anything. Yeah. It, <laughs> Anyone who's used a vacuum cleaner knows when yeah, there's a It blockage. makes a completely different sound. Like it's like, like the, the sound mm. changes and, and it's duller. it does stop sucking things up. Which is the key in the case <laughs> of, of, yeah. of a vacuum cleaner and, not working. And if, and if it's not the pipe, it might be the yeah. bag. And, and if you go too far, you start to smell uh, burning electrics. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking it might have been improved if, if they'd also thrown in some encouraging stuff as well. Like, so if there's nothing oh, wrong, yeah. like, every so often she just goes, oh, you're doing a great job with this hoovering today or something mm. like that, you know. Like seductively, Ross, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my, my, my pipe's it. not in action at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, use my smaller head. <laughs> Um, have you seen the uh, the AR thing that they're trying to roll in there now, which is um, where I don't think it's specifically related to the vacuum cleaner, but like, you know, with the new kind of Apple Vision Plus and, you know, whatever, it'll make basically map the floor and kind of understand what kind of Hoover head, what vacuum cleaner head you're using. And as you push it through the carpet or whatever, it shows you, it kind of erases the bits that you've done. So you can see oh, nice. what you haven't done. Nice. It's fucking brilliant, Ross. <laughs> I absolutely love it. It's one of those things like now I understand what AR is for. <laughs> but then I'm a three. I'm a three vacuum man. So you know I've got oh, vacuums man. for everything. It's 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 a uh, it's um it's a problem the male members of my family have. <laughs> Uh, we all like vacuums, vacuums, and vacuuming. Well, I tell you who you should join. You should. Um, I mean, I, I think I dipped into this on the the previous time we had on the Va- Philippa Forrester sexy Valentine's robot vacuum. Oh, special. of course, yes. Yeah, well, I dipped into this before, like saying that the amount of vacuum cleaner fans oh, yeah. there are on the internet is astonishing. Yeah, like real sort of some proper hardcore vac fans. Like it's it's their life. There's, I mean, there's a couple of a couple of things I picked up. So if you look at the bottom of Right at the bottom mm-hmm. of the our document, there. Can you see that array of? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah. So that is somebody on vacuumland.org, <laughs> which is one of the vacuum cleaner forums that I went on, and that is somebody who. So the this talking vacuum cleaner is part of the Hoover Sensortronic range, and it's this is the the one we look at. How it's demonstrating here is the Sensortronic three three hundred audio. So it's basically the top of the range, and as you can see, that he's put yeah. that carefully in the centre of his array. Oh, yeah, yeah, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. One, definitely. two, three, four, five, six, seven. So he's got eight. So this bloke has basically collected the entire Hoover Sensortronic range. He's got, he's got a message saying, a quick picture before I put these away in storage for now, as I have no space for them at home. I'm a big fan of the Sensortronic range. Well, while they're not the lightest Hoover ever made, they are cool with all the lights and the Talking Audio 300. Now, if anyone had a Blue System 40 to complete my collection, I'd be happy to buy it. Smiley face. Cheers, Mark. Um, (laughs) A, I was wondering, is that you? No, it's not me. No. B, like, and and then like underneath it, there's loads of people just admiring like all of his hoovers and like going, wow, that's that's a sweet. Oh, you've got the Audio 300. That's real (laughs) sweet and all that. Like, it, it, it. Bro, <laughs> it, 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 like, it, it appears that it's no different from I oh, know classic cars or anything like any of that. Mm. All of that stuff—it's mad, isn't it? Mad? Is it mad? But is it? No, it's mad. <laughs> Russ, it's mad. 
but 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 no no it totally is but like it, it's it's mad in and it it's vaguely explicable to me like I, I i do get it but but here's the thing i, I look at those eight <laughs> vacuum cleaners and i think like yeah but they can't do as good a, as good as job as like a vacuum cleaner now yeah not as good as my new car uh, well, they certainly aren't, Ross. Well, well I mean, you, your, car, your car chair can clear a lake. Yeah. You know? I mean, can, can the system vac 300 do that? No, I don't think so. Um, and equally, you know, my robot vacuum cleaner will, will happily chunder around until it gets lost with his little LiDAR making a map and telling, you know, and goes back to his little hutch and, and tells me he's done a good job and I don't have to do anything. No, I mean, it, it, it is the male propensity towards kind of nerdness and collection, which I suppose makes it, allows me to understand. But having said that, it is a bit weird. Do you think, do you think there's anything in it that it reminds them of being a kid? Because in, in many ways, vacuum cleaners remind me of being a kid because they remind me of my mum vacuuming the house. So do you think there's anything in it they derive comfort from vacuum cleaners because it reminds them of being a child and being with their family? Is that what it is? Oh, I mean, I like that. Yeah, I mean, I would hope it's I would hope it's as, as as positive a reason as that, and and that that they get some kind of nice emotional reinforcement. At some point, though, you do go through the event horizon, and I mean, I don't. <laughs> maybe you get lost. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I, I look at the picture, and I, and I, and I suppose I, I I admire the commitment, and I appreciate the the same family of vacuum cleaners. A is not a terribly impressive collection. <laughs> Especially when you're missing one. If you're missing one, if you're missing one ninth of the entire collection of vacuum cleaners, you shouldn't be advertising that you've got the collection, then, should you? It's like I, you know, like what, what, where's the what, what, what's with all the braggadocio? I, I can see that the blue one is missing. It's, I wonder where, he's, where the storage is as well. I wonder if you he's paying for the storage. Oh gosh, what, what are they on? The, the back row of five. What are they on? Uh, some kind of some kind of weird curved cur- 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 leather, leather bar sideboard, isn't it? Of some sort. Oh my god! Yeah, because it's got a door on the right hand side. Oh my god! Ugh, disgusting. Hoover bags in there, maybe. No, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so Filthy freak. So then I was I, I was hoping I could find a TV advert for this for the Sensatronic three hundred audio. It doesn't look like they did advertise it on TV. But then I these must have been expensive. There's no way they were selling these. The top these. of the range, wasn't it? I guess. Yeah. Um, but I then discovered something quite interesting. So there's a vacuum cleaner YouTuber called I B A I S A I C, and the reason he's called that, as he explains on his channel, is that it stands for "It beats as it sweeps as it cleans," which was a famous slogan used by the Hoover Company to describe the action of their upright vacuum cleaners. Right. Mm-hmm. He's got a YouTube channel with 147,000 subscribers, and he seems like he seems like a nice bloke. But the interesting, I'm sure, yeah. But the interesting thing here is that I think he invented the unboxing video. <gasps> no. Because, Mark, he was recording himself. He recorded himself unboxing this Hoover Sensatronic 300 mm-hmm. in 1989. Wow. Wow. So what was he sharing it on? He says underneath that he only intended it for one or two friends, and it was only with the I advent of the internet that. that he was able to share it with others. Amazing. So he must have been like a member of some sort of fan club fan club or something. Yeah. Oh, I'm all goose pimply. Whatever. Right. Oh, bloody hell. Oh, God. Look at that. Get away. Go on. Go on out the way. Oh, flipping egg. It is... Oh, it's lighter. Oh, it's... Oh, my God. So, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm not going to come to you and show you the whole thing. But, yeah, it's, you, it's you, like you, a you, fox... The weird thing is, Russ, I, I would happily sit here and watch him unbox this. <laughs> But it's it's eighty nine first. Wow, that's incredible. So it's nineteen eighty nine. So this is a full. This is exactly like an instant unboxing video. Yeah, right? yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so then he he does a second part where he demonstrates how it works, which he presents, which he presents in the style of a nineteen eighties advert. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he does all of this. But lo- okay, wait till you get to the end. Hang on. He does a comedy bit at the end. Oh. Isn't it? Hello! Hey! Paddington! 
I'm sorry about that. He's, uh, he's trying to get into show business. Oh. There we have it. The new Hoover Sensotronic Audio System 300. Tomorrow's world today. So there you have it, Mark. A little Tomorrow's World reference at the end. <laughs> wow. Wow. Imagine um, imagine making that, finding it and going like, oh, I'm going to put that on the internet for everyone to see. I mean, he's got oh, he's got nearly 2,000 Hoover-based videos on his channel. Jeez Louise. That's incredible. I know. I'm, I'm genuinely flabbergasted at the, like, yeah. I didn't understand the Paddington You may section. well have created the unboxing. No, that, that must be a reference to something we don't know. No, let's assume it's a reference to something we don't know. So there's, I mean, there's there's some inventions on this program which not necessarily didn't make it, but one thing that did make it is the unboxing video. And I'm going to say that I S I B A I S A I C invented the unboxing video, Mark. I'm going to go, I'm going to be as bold as to say that. I struggle to believe that anyone was doing it earlier than 1989. No. That can prove it. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So the this anyway, this Hoover had yes. four phrases. We only hear Tower demonstrates two of them, doesn't he? Hose is clogged, clear the blockage, and mm-hmm. bag is not correctly fitted. Mm-hmm. There was also bag is full, and probably the most op- moderately probably easy. the most ominous one. Have cleaner checked by a qualified service technician. Wow, the red ring of death. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They released them in multiple languages. That I, I, there's some. There's a clip of an Italian one saying uh, bag is full in Italian on YouTube. <laughs> if you want to look that up, Mark. <laughs> and also. Well, if you're not going to show it to me, I'm going to have to. Look it up. <laughs> and apparently, somebody reckons that when this was released, as well as it featuring on Tomorrow's World, it was also on ITN News, and it involved one of the reporters interviewing it. But no one's oh, no one's got the footage of that, so it's lost in. No, the I don't believe that. But yeah, there's not been a vac- talking vacuum cleaner since. Apart from that, obviously, one texts you, but that's not quite the same, is it? But other than that, it, it, no, there's not been a no. talk- so it, it it didn't take off as a as a concept. And I can see why, because it's an absolutely bloody stupid idea. It's annoying. <laughs> it's, it's it's annoying. Yes. Happy now, Dave. You're happy. You're happy. <laughs> but I did enjoy Howard's presentation. To be fair, I enjoyed the um almost yes sort of like the fact they it was almost like they weren't getting on with each other. Like they they didn't like each other. Like the no the thing. yes they were a An- double antagonist uh, had had long learned to uh, uh, hate each yeah. other. And, and, and actually, uh, thinking of this, but also the flight scandal, it's like, it is amazing to reflect on how Hoover went from being the thing we described the product to basically disappearing as a brand that you can buy. I'm, I'm sh- I, I know there are Hoovers available, but like, who, who buys a Hoover? You buy you buy a Dyson or a Karcher or a Shark or, or whatever. It's like, or of course a Russell Hobbs. And no wonder that other lesser, no doubt lesser podcast <laughs> focused an episode on that, because I think it is it is quite astonishing, really. Mm. Then again, if they were making products like this, they probably deserve to go under. <laughs> Let's go. If you want to see Britain's architectural heritage at its best, there aren't many places better than Hampton Court Palace. But three years ago, fire destroyed some of that heritage. It gutted most of the king's staterooms built by Sir Christopher Wren 300 years ago. Wood carvings, silk canopies and other irreplaceable treasures all ended up in a sodden pile of ashes on the floor. Restoration was put in the hands of the government's property service agency and was started immediately. This is the unharmed Queen's drawing room, typical of the sort of fine 17th century interior decoration they'll be trying to recreate. And this is the burnt-out King's audience chamber. As you can see, the restorers have got a long job ahead of them. But at the moment, work has started on reconstructing the timber trusses that support the roof of this chamber. 
Much of the center portion of this roof collapsed. Lead melted and even iron braces twisted. But astonishingly, some of the timbers that roasted in the blaze for six hours will be used in the new roof. You see, when Wren originally built these support timbers, he used oak and nothing but the solid heart wood. So when the engineers came along to inspect the damage, they found that the timbers were as solid as ever. The charring was only skin deep. In fact, once it had formed, the charring acted as sort of insulation, protecting the interior of the wood from the fire. So now, all that the contractors have to do is to clean it off. So, sandblasting has given these old timbers a new lease of life. But if the restorers aren't very careful, all this work could be undone because of another legacy from the fire downstairs on the ground floor. This particular threat can hide anywhere. Specialists have to inspect every remote corner for the first signs of trouble, even if it means using this converted medical endoscope. And this is what they're looking for dry rot. During the blaze, thousands of gallons of water poured down into these lower rooms and these walls will probably never completely dry out. And that's the perfect site for dry rot to flourish. So the answer was to set up a sort of dry rot surveillance system. And the first line of defence are these wooden rods. They're set up around these walls here to try and tempt the dry rot fungus to betray itself. And it's done exactly that here. But there's a second rather more sophisticated system. In each of the affected rooms, there's a small box. They're connected to permanent moisture sensors set up at strategic points on the timbers. And by plugging into here, I can get a reading from each and every one of them. When the restoration is completed, it's hoped that all of the moisture sensors will be linked up to a computer so that the state of Hampton Court's timbers could be constantly monitored. But besides the wood, there are still singed silk canopies, stained paintings and melted chandeliers to be restored to this original standard. And it'll be at least the 1990s before the King's state rooms are once again open to the public. Don't get your Hampton Court, Mark. Hey. Brilliant. <laughs> I didn't realise that's actually based on Cockney Army slang, that. Hampton Wick Prick. Oh, didn't know that. Anyway, um, <laughs> neither of us have ever been to Hampton Court, have we? No. no. It, seems like, it seems like very remiss. Have you ever been to Tower of London? Oh. Yes. I was going to say, it seems like one of those things, like, a bit like Tower of London, where, where you just never, but you have been there. I mean, it does look, it does yes. look nice. Well, no, it's, yes, uh, never, it does. It's never, it's never, um, never been on my radar as anything to to go to. I was too busy hanging around Hever Castle for most of my youth to to ever <laughs> consider making it all the way to Hampton Court. And I think I think that's the difference is is that um, you grew up near Hever Castle. The Tower of London is in the middle of London, whereas Hampton Court is <sighs> I don't know. It feels like a long way away, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I, is it is it in Richmond? It's Richmond, isn't it? That area. Yeah. 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 yeah west. Way out west, Mark. I don't to... go. I don't go to the west. No, no. but it was uh, built for Card built for Cardinal Wolsey. What well, Cardinal Wolsey wanted to build the most impressive palace in in England. He paid two. He paid oh, two hundred. Very crowns. Christian of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paid two hundred crowns for it. <laughs> Got it. Started building it in fifteen fourteen, um, and then by fifteen twenty nine, he'd fallen out of favour with his his mate Big Henry the Eighth. Mm. And uh, so, in try, trying to like win Henry VIII's favour back, he just gave him it. Just go, just went, oh yeah, yeah can lovely. you be yeah. my friend again? Uh, here you go, here's so mm. Hampton Court. I don't think it really worked because he died a year later. So, but Henry loved it. He absolutely loved Hampton Court. It was his favourite palace. 
So he set about uh, expanding it and all that. Yeah, and then all the Tudors lived in it, loved it. And then a few like hundred, couple of hundred years later, William the Third turns up, and he's really jealous of the Palace of Versailles. So he mm-hmm. reckons he wants to turn Hampton Court rather than being a Tudor palace, he wants to turn it into a Baroque palace like Versailles. Mm-hmm. So he gets mm. Christopher Wren in, and he asks Christopher Wren to do some conversions. So they knock down half of the Tudor bits. They keep some of it. The front bit, the famous front bit, is Tudor. Yeah, but a lot, large other parts of it they knocked down and replaced it with this big Baroque Christopher Wren design stuff. And then suddenly in uh, in nineteen eighty uh, in nineteen eighty six. Old uh, Lady Daphne Gale, who was living there rent-free because she happened to be the wife of a famous British Army general, the widow of a famous British Army general. She had the habit of going to bed with a lit candle. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> like, you know, like a Victorian would. And somehow, they're not sure how, she managed to set fire to, to, to the, the palace and... She was actually the only casualty. They they found her charred and burnt body in the next day in the morning. She died. She burnt to death. Oh, gosh. Yes. Oh, the, bloody the, hell. There was something wrong with the fire system, which meant that the alarms didn't go off until after the after the fire brigade had arrived. So they reckon the fire had been burning for quite a, for quite a long time before anybody noticed. Jeez Louise. Yeah. Fire brigade turned up and it, it, they go, oh, this is really taken hold. They did. They obviously managed to put it out. And but yeah, she was a she. They found her charred body the next day. Uh, but she was the only casualty, and also the the staff of the the place they had some sort of emergency procedure. If anything goes wrong, they knew exactly how to run in and get all of the expensive stuff. So, oh, okay, yeah, which they managed to do. So only only yeah. in the end, only two paintings were burnt. Everything else got they got out, uh, which you know that's good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, neither of you benefited from their smartness because we've not no, seen it. No. But I'm glad it's there. Yeah. It's quite interesting because the whole thing about wooden buildings, which I didn't realise, is that actually wooden buildings, it's the reverse of what you think. They actually burn much more slowly than like, mm. modern buildings. And as you can see, and I think Peter illustrates it really well here, when he, when he mm. shows you the, the, the oak beams. Yes. And they basically, just the outside of them got singed. And the, yeah. inter- and the inter- as you say, it looks like a lovely brisket with the with the singed exterior. It's a delicious barbecue brisket. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All you need to do is just blast that exterior off, and you've got some lovely, perfectly good oak beams underneath. It, it's a very convincing demonstration as to why the hard wood oak beams hadn't burned down. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, they're, they're basically. It seems like they're untouchable. Why aren't we? All, why, why aren't we making all the houses out of giant wooden oak beams? Yeah. Well, speak for yourself, Mark. I mean, my house has got oak leaves in it. Oh, I'm sorry, Russell. We can't all live in a tiny Dutch fisherman's helmet. <laughs> helmet. Hamlet. Fisherman's helmet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of us has to live in modern houses in London, Ross. Forgive me. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the segment itself, I don't know. It's not that... Know. What's my house made of? The segment itself, it's, it's not really... It's not hugely... Interesting in that much, and all he's really showing us is that he's got like a moisture detector to see check for dry rot, isn't he? Really, is that? Yeah, actually, the, the most interesting thing is is learning how hard giant hardwood beams are basically impervious to fire. That's yeah. really interesting. The, the technology stuff is, you know, like oh, this is how we will find out whether the beams are rotting or they'll be fine in the future. Is is neither here nor there to me. To be honest. I kind of, as I was watching this the second or third time, I was thinking like, this piece would actually work better when they had finished doing the reconstruction. Yes. And they were going to show you how the same thing can't happen again. Actually, it doesn't even feel like we're halfway through. There's, you know, we're at the beginning of the process. So it's kind of, I don't know, it's a bit blue ballsy. I mean, like, it's kind of like, I don't, it's more of a tease than it is a really doesn't land on anything, I don't think. No, no. It's just yeah, McCann fingering some dry rot and then fiddling about with yeah. a moisture detector. Yeah, which is, you know, you know. Eh. But the thing I'll take away is the is the briskety beef. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just saw, saw off a couple of slices of that. Mm. <laughs> I did make me hungry, I must say. Maybe reminisce about my uh, my trip around the, uh, the southern yeah. states, Russ. Yeah. I, I did. I, I did. One, I did. One. Why is it called dry rot? Because it, it goes to great pains to explain that the reason why they've got dry rot is because it's wet. <laughs> because because the the, ho- the, the yeah, water. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Made, made the palace soaking wet, I, and that caused dry I rot. I had seen dry rot before, but I don't know why it's dry rot. Well, I looked at it. And it amazingly, the I hoped you would do the Wikipedia article for dry rot is, I would say, seventy five percent 
explanation as to why it's called dry rot when it's wet. <laughs> and it's 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 because back in the day when the main concern about rot was ships. Yes. Ships would get would would rot at sea, but the the fact that the the wood was wet would hold it together. So although there was rot there, the ship would remain intact. It was only when they brought them into dry dock for maintenance or repair, the boat would dry out and then the rotten parts of it would then dry out much more and then they just crumble. So t- from the perspective right. of the people looking at the ship, they would think that this was dry rot, but actually it wasn't. It was already rotten. It was just the fact that it went, it, the yeah. process of drying out had made it structurally unsound and collapse. So that's why it's called dry rot, Mark. Oh, interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. There you go. So is that, is that a malapropism then? Is that is that what you call that? Like Misnomer, um, I think. Yeah. A misnomer, yeah, that makes more yes. sense. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, they, they, the rest- restoration went really well, Mark. They, they finished it on. It was unveiled on the seventh of July, nineteen ninety-two, by the Queen, and in total, it cost them ten million pounds to do. But yeah, now if you go there now, you wouldn't even know that uh, there had been a fire or a, an old widow had burnt to death. It just <laughs> looks like it always did. Lovely. <laughs> oh, and if you want one of those timber master. You want a timber master mm. moisture meter? Oh yes, yes, I, I, I'd love one. Two hundred and fifty quid, Mark, that'll cost you. Gosh, how many have you bought? I, well, I, I, I paid somebody to test my timber before I bought this house, Mark, and, and he said it was all fine. Cowboy, Russ, cowboy. How are you <laughs> supposed to know without your own timber master? I can just use my um, my new vacuum cleaner to suck the moisture out of the out of the wood. <laughs> That's true. Just just stick on the yeah, wall, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've just caught me right in the middle of something. And I do know that I am bang in the middle. Because of this, it is a double-ended tape measure. Pull one end and the other end comes out by exactly the same amount. So no matter what the width is, you always know exactly where the middle is. Right. That's more like it. And finally, before we go, here's Howard, just to bring us up to date with that nationwide telephone vote we ran last week. Who does she think she is? Well, it was, in fact, the largest number of telephone votes ever recorded in this country. The question was, should summertime be introduced all year round, with lighter evenings but darker mornings? While a telephone vote like that can never truly reflect people's opinions up and down the country, the figures were interesting. Now, those we gave you last week were for all calls, but taking just the calls made through digital exchanges gives us a regional breakdown. And there were some interesting differences, with the South voting about 5 to 1 in favour of year-round summertime, whilst Edinburgh was almost evenly split. Overall, though, you were more than 3 to 1 in favour with 158,445 calls for yes and 47,939 for no. Well, that's all for this week. We'll be back at the same time next Tuesday. Do try and join us then. Until then, good night. I can't believe, Mark, before this episode came out, that builders across the land were struggling to find the middle of of, of any measurement between two set points. How did they manage to find the, the, the middle of two set points without this two-ended tape measure that Maggie's demonstrating to I us. Can, I can only assume they use a sextant at night <laughs> to guide themselves by the night stars. I can't think of any, any other me- mechanism. It's a pretty limited market for this, isn't there, Mark? It's literally just people who work in the trades who can't do simple arithmetic. <laughs> is the, is the... <laughs> can't divide a number by yeah. two. <laughs> that, is the, uh, that is the only market for a two, two-ended two Measurement tape, isn't it? But, but also, my assumption is that it would only work for quite a small length of material because you can, you, you're can you only getting half the tape yes. measure yeah, yeah. because it has to store in twice. Uh, yeah. It, uh, yeah. It, it's, um, what a weird, what a weird choice because they really could have gone into, oh, by the way, last week we had this po- fo- phone vote here's the results i would imagine if you were at home you'd be quite excited to find that out but they had this weird 30 second end of the pier nonsense <laughs> just why they just got their stuff they're packing the episode mark they're packing it with stuff it's, it's better they it's are better, they it's are better to have, yeah, it's better yeah. to have too much stuff than not enough mm-hmm. isn't it <laughs> isn't it yeah yeah i suppose yeah 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 you're right russ i'm such a cynic <laughs> 
But suffice to say, those things don't exist, as you as you might be shocked to discover. I look for double ended tape you. measures; they don't <laughs> exist. So on to Howard's outro. Interested that he said that it is the biggest telephone vote ever done, or sort of was that? Effect? That is a huge claim, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't that such a that's that a, such a, a testament claim. to the popularity and the viewership of Tomorrow's World at this time that that, that they were able to garner the most ever telephone votes for just people the largest number of telephone votes ever recorded in this country yeah that's huge i mean that's just just for yeah. people to, i mean that, that is people yeah. to decide whether they want or don't want gmt in british summertime bst yeah which is a bit of a hoary old topic isn't it because it, it, i'm slightly exaggerating because it comes around yes. annually yeah, yeah. but it does kind of come around annually it's never going to change so let's all move on with our lives <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It's one of those weird ones, actually, in that there's constant efforts to change it everywhere, and it yes. just they keep fa- like there's yeah. there's, 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 there's yeah, yeah. It keeps failing. So Britain has changed it a couple of times. So during the war, during the war, we had we still changed the clocks, but we were an hour ahead both times. So in the winter. We had British summertime. British summertime, and in in, so, in the and summer we had British summertime. Plus we had one. BDST, British double summertime. They, double <laughs> yeah, summertime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it, it, was, it was purely to, it was purely to save save energy because it's you, you you just it just burns yeah. less fuel in how you running on summertime. And so then they they revoked it at the end of the war. They were rationing the night. Yeah, yeah. They revoked it at the end of the war. But then in 1947, there was a massive fuel shortage, so they brought it back for one year only. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Popular demand. And then went back to normal again. And then in the 60s, from 1968 to 1971, they just bit, they just stuck to British summertime all year round for three years uh, and then just decided to bin that off again after, after that three-year experiment. Okay. Yeah. And then so the so most the- recent time they tried to do it in Britain was in 2012 – Parliament debated, debated again, debated it again, and it's always to keep it as British summertime. It's never to keep it as yes, GMT. no, never. Yeah, ex- exactly correct. Yeah, um, but that got filibustered by its opponents. Include it was it a, it was a private members' bill, I see. Including seen, it? one, it must have been a private members' bill. Okay, including yeah. Mr. Jacob Rees Mogg. Oh yeah, who hilariously tried to introduce an amendment. Uh, to give Somerset its own time zone that's 15 minutes behind London. Because obviously, okay. yeah, technically, Somerset is 15 yep. minutes behind London. So, yeah, that got chucked out. The EU, they've actually, that in 2019, they rubber stamped, right, we are going to do this. We are going to, we're going to stick with one set European yep. time and we're not going to, and we're not going to change it. And then since then, there's been a few things happening in the world since then that's meant that it's got kicked into the long grass. So technically, Europe should be pursuing only sticking to one time, but they haven't bothered as well. It has been pointed out that the Benelux countries, France and Spain, are all on the wrong time anyway. They should they yeah, should all be on yeah. G- they should all be on British time. Yeah. And the yeah. only reason they're not they used to be on British time. The only reason they're not is our old friend Adolf Hitler. When he invaded them, he made them switch to German time, and they never switched back because they thought it'd be too much hassle. So before the before the first Second World War, they were on they were on the same time zone. So yeah, so that's another thing to think about. And then the Americans. They they want to do it as well, so they wanted to stop changing mm. their clocks. So the Senate in twenty twenty two unanimously, which is quite unusual, uh, yeah. passed yeah, yeah, a bill yeah. to for permanent <laughs> summertime in America. Went to the House of Representatives and they they binned it off. Didn't want it. So there's this weird thing where everyone wants to stick with one time, and then there's just these stick in the muds that that sort of somehow hamper efforts. But the thing is, like to me, there are two issues one is that it only really works if everyone agrees so i, I would ha- hazard a guess pulling numbers out of my ass because not every country or location has a daylight savings time style swap well, turkey doesn't famously no th- i know there are a few that don't yeah but in general i would hazard a guess that 80 percent of countries probably have a daylight savings time and i would imagine like 95 percent of the countries that we are culturally connected to probably have some kind of daylight savings time and a lot of them change when we do or we change when a lot of them do and there is that weird time every year twice a year where we go one week ahead of the united states so unless everyone does at the same time we have the very awkward situation where we will always be we'll either be five or six 
six hours ahead of New York, depending, and you have to look up in the calendar to find out when it is. When in reality, we're only ever two weeks, you know, 50 weeks out of the year, we're always five hours ahead of New York because they do the same thing, just slightly different time. And the other thing is, I said to you in the notes, is like, I genuinely do not believe that Britain will decide that the time zone in Greenwich will be Greenwich Mean Time plus one. No. That is so insane that I just don't think people will be able to. And there's also that kind of true. Uh, there's that. There's that kind of you know. Um, there's a kind of a one of those kind of weird legal rules that because there are all these different time zones, you actually have to have a kind of a standard acceptance of what day it is and what year it is and not what time it is, but like what year it is. And the rule is it the the year is the year when it's midnight in Greenwich. I'm good to work because so, UTC you know, so, is basically the same as Greenwich, isn't it? Exactly, is 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 GMT. So the the idea that the actual time zone in Greenwich will be different to Greenwich Mean Time is so stupid. Yeah. When you say it out loud, I just don't think any government will ever vote for it, no. unless all our European neighbours do it and the US do it. At which point we'd be like, well, you know, it'll be just so mad to be out of sync with everyone else. And I do kind of think that most people would prefer more daytime light but yeah it, it, it's weird how this comes up all the time and it never quite lands well because the, 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 it always seems to be that the main complaint the main complaint for changing the clocks uh is that oh uh, if you don't then farmers have to get up when it's dark yeah and i just think that's, they that's really the most insane thing you know because far, farmers yeah. are self-employed businessmen they don't have to get up a set time at all they that's just get up true. when it's light yeah. It makes no difference yeah. to them. I, I don't because care. the animals aren't going to. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. animals don't look at clocks yeah. and go. Well, I mean, it's past my. <laughs> no, yeah, Stop they don't care. They, they'll, they'll change. Yeah. yeah, they're all evil anyway. We know that. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. I see what they do. So freaky abalones. <laughs> yeah. abalones. Oh, I don't know. It it it, it amuses me because um, there are very good reasons to stay at British summertime. There, there really are. Uh, it mostly kind of boils down to. People get really depressed in the winter, especially in Britain. I don't know if, if you ever see one of those amazing maps where they kind of map the amount of daylight hours in the United States versus Europe. It is, well, it's night and day. And it's one of those things where like, if you, especially as kind of people who kind of grew up in Britain, we often go like, why are the Americans so annoyingly, relentlessly happy <laughs> and cheerful? And then you look at these maps where they basically get like 16 hours of daylight every day. And you go like, <laughs> as opposed to like, you know, in, in, in the depths of December, when like it's dark at like 2.30, there was a famous, I'm sure I've said this story on the, on the podcast before, but there was a footballer who joined Manchester City from, sorry, Manchester United from Barcelona. And his, his wife was fucking furious. <laughs> she'd, ne- she'd, never under- she'd never heard of anywhere in the world where the sun went down at three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> she's like, she's like, what the hell is this? No wonder everyone's so miserable. And, you know, and, and she's, she was right. She was right. It is, it is kind of unacceptable and intolerable. And you realise just how, how far north we are <laughs> in a global yeah. sense. Um, you know, yeah. an, an extra hour of daylight really would make a huge difference. But you can only do it if everyone agrees to do it at the same time. Otherwise, you, you, you're going to be living in this weird world where you're never terribly sure what time it is elsewhere. Yeah. And we'll always be tracking yeah, I mean, other, other countries' daylight savings. My, my other suggestion is that is, like, time is the only thing where we adjust it. Why is everybody wedded to the idea of having... Is of, of, get, of, of getting up uh, <laughs> getting up at 8am, at yeah. say... Obviously, I don't, but most people do. And then having lunch at 12 p.m. and then having dinner at 6 and, and going to bed at 10 or whatever. That sort of arrangement is that. Yeah. There's no re- – those are arbitrary numbers. Why don't we just have the same time all around the world and people in America just get up at uh, midday or whatever it will be? I can't, I'm not doing the maths in my head. but uh, Yeah, but, I get your point. But, but yeah. Like, yeah. Because we don't, we, we don't change the month. We it's, don't change it, yeah. it so that Australia has July when we have – December just because yep. July should be a summer month. So why do we change the clocks so that the times of day are always at the same time? Don't That's need a very good be. question. Yeah, because because then if you said to somebody in New York, well, let's have a meeting at one o'clock. It's one o'clock in New York. Yeah. E- e- even if it's what would feel like 8 a.m. because they just got up. Like it, it's actually yeah. 1300 because, yeah, I get your point. That, that's that's not, a, yeah, that's not unfair, Shay. Because I, I, I remember there was a pub quiz I went to and the question was, 
how many time zones are there in the world? And the answer that the quiz master gave was there are 24, uh, there are 24 time zones in the world, which is utter bollocks. <laughs> and I very rarely would go up and, and argue an answer with a quiz master, but there are two reasons I did. One, because I asked him to look up the time in New Delhi, and uh, India famously is five and a half hours ahead of us. <laughs> and then the other thing was, behind the quiz master, there was a map of the world split into time zones for us. <laughs> and I said, fucking count how many there are behind you, you absolute idiot. It's like, you didn't even look up the answer. You just yeah. assumed there are 24 hours. Like, I've been to India. It is five and a half hours, away, which is one of those kind of weird things, which is like, it, it kind of it makes you question what time is. Because <laughs> it turns out you can just make a time yeah. up and it doesn't matter as long as it's consistent. You're absolutely right. If it's midday in... I, I suppose the only problem with it is like um, midnight and midday yeah. kind of mean something outside of the actual time. Yeah. But that that would change. Because yeah. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't say midday. Mid, no. You know, midday, mid, midnight would be the middle of the night and whatever the time was. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There is absolutely, everyone uses the same days, they use the same months and they see, use the same year. Why can't they use the same time? And then, you know, actually that would call, that would that would solve so many problems, wouldn't it, with trying to work out. Because that meeting at 10 p.m. online would be the same 10 p.m. for everyone, whether it was in the daylight in one place or nighttime in another. Yeah. You should write to your local Dutch MP, <laughs> Ross. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I've yeah, I've just solved it. You have, you have solved it, and then then it wouldn't matter whether we we do daylight savings or whatever, because the time wouldn't change. No. We just all agree to get up at an earlier time or whatever. <laughs> yeah. From the third week of March, East Enders is going to be one hour yeah. earlier than it normally <laughs> is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and everybody who phones in as, uh, to that thing supports British summer time all year round, don't they? Mostly, was it two thirds? Or... It was two thirds, wasn't it? To one third, yeah. Well, we need to get Howard... Which I get, you know, because, you know... We need to get Howard to arrange a worldwide phone vote, putting my questions yeah. to the world. All right, Howard, if you're listening, get on it. And that is it, Mark. That's all I've got. That is it, yeah, yeah. Gosh, we, we you know, all fair, you and I were so enthused earlier about how much we were rattling through this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so well done, us, because we did. We finished this in record time, Russ. So shall we crunch the numbers and order this episode? Yep. So let's start with the year in context. Tell me about the cinema box office. 89. Two of my favourite ever films in this in this rundown. See if you can spot them. Oh, wow. Okay. Number 10, Scandal. I didn't know Driving Miss Daisy came out this month. <laughs> Scandal. The uh, Scandal, yeah. Profumo film. Number yep. 9, Fatal Beauty. Never heard of that. Whoopi Goldberg in it. Number 8, High Hopes. Number 7, Die Hard. Oh. Dance. Booby. Booby, baby. <laughs> Number six, The Accused. And your white knight. <laughs> the Accused. Number five, DOA. Number four, The Accidental Tourist. Oh, wow. Number three, The Naked Gun from the Files of no. Police Scott. <laughs> wow. Number two, Dangerous Liaisons. And number one, oh, Rain God. Man. That's a pretty good list. There's some good films on there. Uh, pop chart, Russ. Uh, number 10, Blow the House Down, Living in a Box. Number mm -hmm. 9, I Don't Want a Lover by Texas. I didn't realise that song was that old. Oh, wow. No, I knew it was old, but not that old. Gosh. Number 8, Can't Stay Away From You, 1989 by Gloria Estefan and Miami Sound Machine. Number 7, Hey Music Lover, S Express. Number 6, Belfast Child, Simple Minds. Number 5, Leave Me Alone, Michael Jackson. Number four, Stop, 1989 by Sam Brown. Number three, Help mm. by Banana Rama and La La Ni Nu Nu Nu. Uh, call me when it's a stonk. I can stonk, say it's Russ. no stonk, is it? Number <laughs> yeah. two, Love Changes Everything by Michael Ball. And number one, Too Many Broken Hearts by Jason oh, Donovan. Wow. Gosh, prices? Prices. Gallon of petrol, 186. Bottle of whiskey, Bells, £8.59. Pint of bitter, 96 pence. Pint of lager, £1.06. 20 fags, £1.50. Uh, Philips VHS recorder, 299 99 
uh, mobile phone, which is a Motorola 9800X, 1,765 pounds. Average house price, 72,000 pounds. Two litres of Coca-Cola, 69p. Ford Sierra Laser, 9,050 pounds. And tub of a flora margarine with no whales in it, 59 pence. Mm. I wonder how much it would have cost if there was whale in it. Mm. I'll go to cut log. It is, Mark. The mighty Russell Hobbs Reflections Top Line Automatic Kettle, <laughs> Key Metal Body, Soft Grip Handle, Locking Lid, Water Level Indicator, Maximum Capacity 2.7 Pints, 2,000 Watts, R Price £25.75. I, I was earlier slightly tongue-in-cheek decrying the labour of that chap who was collecting the specific model of Hoover vacuum cleaner. Yeah. But can you imagine if somebody out there started collecting every mighty Russell Hub kettle from every year of the Argos catalogue. Yeah. How, how could you not be impressed by that kind of... Oh, incredible. Uh, magazine covers, Russ. New Scientist it has a collage of a, of a man with all of his organs on show, and there's two hands waving eggs at him, and one of the eggs says, <laughs> good for you, question mark. Headline is scrambled messages. So I guess mm. this is a salmonella thing. I don't know. Mm, or, must or be, maybe, surely, yeah. Or possibly that. I think co- that happened was, after Major's re-election. Was it the cholesterol thing, maybe? They, they need to go oh, back on about how yeah. lost, lost, lost the cholesterol, didn't they? Yeah. Popular science, micromotors. Motors so tiny they can pass through a needle's eye. Promise advances in fields from medicine to nuclear energy. Scientific American, solar-powered car wins a race and points the way forward for practical electrical vehicles. I don't think you could ever get a solar-powered car, could you? I mean... No. Time magazine. No, time the Tower Fiasco. Bush faces his first crisis. What's the Tower Fiasco? I don't remember. It means nothing to me. Also, 7th of March. It's a bit rich to be saying, like, he's only been in the job two months. You're looking it up? Tower Fiasco, 1989. All, that's, all I'm getting is this Time magazine cover. <laughs> okay. There we go. Didn't leave much of a cultural footprint then, though. There's also okay. the Ayatollah Khomeini on there with Khomeini's real battle. He was, he was, he was hot stuff in 1989. He's even, the, he's, he's yeah. even in the beginning of the, of the Naked Gun, actually. There's, the, is, there's that, there's that oh, meeting. Oh, he is, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Frank yeah. Drevin beats them all up and he says, don't let me catch any of you in the United States of America. <laughs> um, for Tea and Times... I really want to watch that again. For Tea and Times has a picture of an Archaeopteryx on the front. Okay. Private Eye is actually changed its name to Private Eye Atolla. Oh. So a picture of him on the front, and one of his mates is saying, have you read the book? And mm-hmm. he's saying, do you think I'm mad? Uh, obviously, the, oh, the clever. book being the Satanic Verses, of course. The, the Satanic Verses, yes, absolutely. Uh, Viz, after 25 years, we named Kennedy's killer. We asked the question, has Fergie got a fat ass or what? Win your own TV series, exclusive I'm Flat Broke, The Queen Speaks Out, and Fabulous Scientist Joke on page three. And Playboy, Latoya Jackson, Michael's sister in a thriller pictorial. She's in the front cover there. I always think it's weird that uh, Latoya Jackson decided to have exactly the same plastic surgery in order to make herself look exactly like her brother. Is Is that weird? That's weird, isn't it? Yes, Russell, it is weird. (laughs) Yes. 100%. 100%. Plus an interview with Tom Hanks, super groupie Pamela, and scuba driving thrills and drug bust that went bonkers. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, then. Let's get out of brass tacks here. Most important invention. I would say... Digital... It's got to be the digital camera, camera? thing, really, isn't it? Yeah. Or either that or the hub motor. They're the only two real, really worthwhile ones, I think. They are a bit. How about we uh, split the difference again with both yeah. of them? Most worthless invention? The plane washer isn't that great. Talking, the talking, talking vacuum cleaner. Sure. I mean, come oh, on. Well, no, what about the... Yeah. What about the disgusting SIG? Oh, yeah. It like shit. But in a sense, I suppose that big gap, that big gap vape there, didn't it? Like that kind of went somewhere. I am amused by a segment of the population who famously have bad taste buds rejecting it because it tasted awful. Has, it, has that gone through and come out the other side? Like, would you and I found it quite delicious? <laughs> mm, tastes like barbecue. Mm-hmm. Yes, sorry, I'm getting away from myself. So, uh, so smoke a cigarette, the talking vacuum cleaner. Yes, absolutely. And I think talking vacuum cleaner actually. Yeah, is probably probably worst. yeah I, I agree with that one. Uh, a most inaccurate prediction of the future? I always, this one's normally quite difficult, isn't it? Because they don't usually predict the future. It is. But we normally find some, something to hang, hang this on. No, nah, don't worry about it. Worst screw up? I mean, I think that's McCann Can's... cacking up with the auto caddy. Yeah, or Anna's blinking. That's amazing, Russ. I, got 80, I, I, I was thinking about it, even when you were talking about something else, I was thinking 83 blinks. 
in one minute and 15 seconds. Like, I, I don't think I could do that. Now, I appreciate she didn't do it in one solid go. No. The thing was that she was doing multiple, she was doing multiple blinks in. in yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, it, it wasn't fire. kind of, it wasn't regular. Yeah. It was like, um, yeah, it was, it was like she was sending a Morse message. Best attempt at making something boring interesting. Oh, the water in Hawaii. I mean, all, all that way, no one needed to go anywhere to explain that. I mean, it, made it certainly she made it more have... interesting for Judith. Oh, yeah, totally. She's living the dream, isn't yeah. she? Or, um, obviously, McCann is furious. Either but... that or, or the opening segment being being made much more exciting with the addition of weaponry. Oh, gosh, yeah. Because it could have been anything. They, they literally could have dropped milk in water like mm. they did in the 60s, in the 70s rather and you'd have had the same impact yeah uh yeah i'll go with that actually i i, I like that one that, that's a that's a good one best use of music so there's two pieces of classical music here we've got the two. we've got the yeah. johann strauss waltz with the airplane cleaning and then we've yep. got william boyce uh yes. solomon which is played during the hampton court section the hampton court thing which actually i would have put money on being um michael nyman but I, so I was surprised when you said it was somebody else. Was, uh, um, I, I didn't mention him actually. William Boyce was a quite a popular composer at the time, a British composer, and he he was yeah. mates with Handel, and he even knew a very young Mozart, and he composed the whole of the coronation of uh, William the <laughs> Third, I think it was, or no, George the Third, sorry. And then just after he died, like people had no interest in him anymore. He did have a research, resurgence recently. He was played at the, both Harry and Meghan's wedding and Charles's coronation. But other than that, people don't really yeah. listen to him all that much. I mean, not cool, but like, yeah. But obviously, I'm going to go for the the Strauss waltz because the illusion of Kubrick. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm clearly Kubrick. I mean, literally, I was about to say. Okay, best or worst use of furniture? It's got to be the podiums, isn't it? The in the cheese section. Oh, I was thinking the the podium counts as furniture that had that candle on the Hampton Court panels of the worst use of furniture. But yes, I think, I think I'm going to go with the podium as well. I think you're absolutely correct. I'm going to say that is furniture, Ross. And that is a colossally brilliant use of furniture. Most notable clothing? Um, I'm going to say Anna Walker's jumpsuit. Howard's yuppie Anna effort. Walker's jumpsuit, I think. Oh, Anna Walker's jumpsuit. Yeah, all right. I'll let you have that one because um, I know that uh, that meant a lot to yeah. you, didn't it? And these, these cold winter <laughs> months. Did we see anything in the episode that made it through to the future? Well, yeah, yeah obviously the, the digital CCD, camera, definitely. Yeah, saw that. The Hawaiian yep. Ocean Science and Technology Park, yep. Yeah, impressively yeah. so. Hub mo- At wheel motors. Hub motors, yep. yep. Listeria, yep. Anti-Listeria. Yeah. Yep. yeah, Animal Walker's still alive. Babies have made Babies, it through. Um, um, the closing of the ozone <laughs> has made it through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wales still around. Yeah, no and Hampton Court Palace. Palace is still going, so that, that's Hampton great. Hampton Court Palace no, was yeah, fixed, yes. So actually, quite quite a solid hit rate. Uh, uh, and what does this episode tell us about the seventh of March, nineteen eighty nine? It tells us that Hoover still thinks it has a future. <laughs> it's still nicely not computers. No computers in this episode at all. Nothing's computery. No, it's all, no, very true. It's all machine. It's still machines at the moment, which I quite like. Because actually, even in the Hampton Court thing, when Peter McCann talks about the new sensor they put in to kind of spot damp issues he talks about how in the future a computer will be able to track it all but at that point he's still having to manually walk around and plug in so yeah you're right yeah this is still this is still a relatively computer free time oh and so there's still quite a lot of and also no one cares about food waste (laughs) well no (laughs) that's that's very true the astonishing Um, amount of food waste in this program on this episode i mean i should be probably not wasted eaten by the crew but yeah yeah absolutely spoilage perhaps yeah i'm confident that Quite a lot of it was consumed. So, in terms of the tropes, then presenter having to speak over louder sounds. I think that's one hundred percent. That's a that's a yes. Uh, not least Anna Walker and the airport. Maggie Philbin's sleeves don't match her. No, body. Unfortunately, not. She was wearing a no. She looked quite bis- not business like, but she looked quite smart this episode. Yeah, but, yes, professional. Something to do with oil rigs? No. Suspiciously obvious brand name in the ad free BBC. Well, we all threw down there at the time, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. Uh, clear and blatant lying? I can't think of anything. No, I don't think there was any like that. Evil farmers? The Hawaiian farmers, if you want to call them that. They <laughs> didn't seem evil yeah. at all. They seemed quite... They seemed no, not at all. Quite responsible people. Yeah, happy with that. There were no lab spaces filled with darkness and coloured lights. There were no Dutch angles. I've given it three hours worth of thought. I don't think Howard was being sexist by explaining or, you know, by demonstrating the camera so i'm not sure there's any casual sexism there weren't any items presented from the gantry For, i don't know whether don't that bit da- where anna steps out of the aeroplane is she standing on a gantry then oh to address them? Is she standing on the steps i don't think that's a gantry I, I like it russ but i don't love it any dad jokes from howard 
I think he was being quite amusing during this, during during the during the Hoover the, segment. He was being fairly pretty, pretty, pretty amusing. Yeah. He did that whole spiel. Yeah. He, he had his he had his hand casually in his pocket while he's hoovering. And he, and he yeah, said, like, I like that. He said something like, I, "Actually, I, I do this quite a lot." So, yeah, and then, yeah, I agree and then with he's that. Like, yeah, he's got his little back and forth with the Hoover. Yeah, and then and then at the one. end, there's quite a nice bit of business in the closing credits where he oh where, Judith where, joins where him. Judith's just sitting on the chair and he makes her lift her legs up and he hoovers underneath her. That's a nice yeah, bit of business. Yeah, there. that is a nice little bit of business. I'll, I'll accept that one. Not accept it. I, I agree. Episode ends in a damp squib. It would do if, if it was that tape measure, ended. which we for, which we forgot luckily, to include in the most worthless invention section. Actually, oh Jesus, yeah, I hadn't even thought about it. It was so throwaway. Yeah, that now replaces whatever <laughs> we said earlier. I, I don't think it does because I think I think if if I'd watched last week's episode, I would have wanted to see the results. Mm, yeah, and I would have been intrigued. So I'm going to go now with that one. Wallowed a McCann abroad or carbon in a small European town? And that's like 100% no. The fact that McCann is in the episode and 100% not abroad uh, means Judith that Han, no. Judith, absolutely. And, and Judith, Judith Han is not the McCann of her generation. Uh, she's completely alpha in there. Yeah. Lasers? No. No No magnets? Was it no magnets? No. You're normally better at remembering whether there's magnets in an episode. I don't think so. Definitely boats. Speaking of, speaking of magnets, and did they? You know, they discovered a new yeah. type of magnetism the other day. I got to sit, Simon. No, I didn't know that. Simon Walls, who went to our school, who I didn't even realise listens to this, but must do because he knew of my obsession with magnets. Sent me a an article from the FT, and they discovered a third type of magnetism. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, cool. If, some, if tomorrow's world is still around, that'd be, they'd be all over that, wouldn't they? Yeah, them and the insane clown posse travel to Shepherd's Bush. No, I don't think so. So that's it, Russ. It's actually a relatively trope-free episode, so I don't know. I, I'm never sure whether I think that's a good thing or a bad thing. I there's a part of me that admires an episode that doesn't have to rely on trope. It is fun ticking them off. There's a part of me that's really disappointed. It's lovely, yeah, just lovely it really ticking is. those little boxes. Oh, I, I enjoy it very much because uh, I really do tick them off. And I really am confident that even with our expanding list, and I'm sure we'll retire some at some point in the future, but I'm, I am very confident at some point in the future, we will watch an episode where we can tick, oh. tick every box, Russ. And at that point, as far as I'm concerned, we can retire this series. <laughs> the last thing I have to say is that <sighs> there are 1,409 episodes of Tomorrow's World. Say it along with me. We've now covered 38, which means that there are only 1,371 episodes left Good for us. Good Lord. I know. If I didn't know better, I'd say that number was going down by one every single time <laughs> I say it, but I, I, I'm not convinced. I don't listen back, so I don't know. Ticking down faster than the seconds of my life, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that was a reason. I, I don't understand how I said earlier that we were actually clipping through this episode. You really did. You 100% th- did that with such confidence. I've just you looked, really at, I've just looked at how long we've been recording for. And it's, yeah, it's, it's nearly four hours. <laughs> I don't understand. I didn't think we've been talking that much. That's so weird. Russ, it's half midnight oh, <laughs> where yeah. you are. Oh, yeah. Well, well I, I think that's demonstration, uh, Dave, that that was an absolute success. Thank you for suggesting the episodes. Yes. And anybody else out there who wants to suggest an episode yeah. and is a paying subscriber, uh, <laughs> <laughs> feel free to send in your suggestions and I'll, yes. I'll disappear back down into Michael Rod's basement to see if I can find it. Mm. No guarantee, no but guarantee. You know, you, you'll try your darndest. Yes, but he, he has yeah. an extensive collection. I've seen it, Mark. I've seen it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late because you saw everything. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Anything else you want to add, Mark, before we go, or is, is that it? No, I'm, I am quite content to finish. Okay. All, right. All right, quitter. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, I've got to go now, actually, because I've just, I've just glanced out of my window into the back garden, and there's this huge pack of wild animals, and they've managed to get... They've, mm. they've, you know, I was talking about my... I've just got that brand new hoover that I've bought. They somehow yeah. managed to get hold of that. They've dragged it out in the garden, and they're tearing it to pieces. Oh, um, my God. Yeah. I, I mean... I shouldn't really be that surprised, Mark, because, of course, famously, nature abhors a vacuum. <laughs> wow. Wow, that was a, that was a long, <laughs> long way to travel, wasn't it? Brilliant, Russ. I've Thank four, you. I've had well, four hours to cover that one. <laughs> Gosh, well, don't let me stop you, Russ. We best finish yeah. right now. Well, yes. So it is goodbye from us. And if you are on the internet, we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Annoyingly, I think my laptop has recorded this episode and not my microphone, but...